Hello, and welcome to a very special first anniversary episode of the Alexander Society. This is a podcast where we discuss the great people and events of history with the help of humanity's oldest and most enduring friend, alcohol. I am your host, a dashing knight with too much disposable wealth, free time, and an insatiable bloodlust I funnel into religious seal, Derek, accompanied by my co-host, my loyal squire who now has to drag my armor a thousand miles across the continent to live in a desert for a couple years, Tim. How you doing, Tim? I'm doing pretty good. It's been a fun couple days since we've talked last for me. How are you doing this week, Derek? Oh, I'm I'm doing fine, actually. I feel good. Uh, work's going great. Uh, the heater, the, it's, it's like 20 degrees. It's been like 20 degrees outside for the last two days. And our heater's still going great, so. Hell yeah. So what are you drinking tonight, Derek? Oh, what am I drinking tonight? Uh, for shots, uh, pulling out uh, pulling out one of the leftovers, that Exotico tequila. Um, partially because it was one of the few things I had left, and partially because and I, was a, I was kind of in a tequila mood. And this stuff's pretty good. I love tequila. I, I just love tequila. Yeah. And for the beers, I'm pulling out those... Uh, Old Reliable Revolver Brewing. I'm pulling out those uh, Demberries that you gave me, the bl- the blueberry beers, and I'm oh, I'm so excited to try these. <laughs> yeah, what are you drinking? So tonight I am drinking that Western Sun vodka, but I had an idea for it, and I couldn't bring the actual idea forward, so I'll do it next week. But I was going to get some of those. They recently released a Warhead soda. Oh man. And my idea was to take the Warhead soda and have about a shot worth of that and a shot worth of vodka. And that'd be my sh- shots for the week. Oh, that. And I thought that would be like kind of like, you know, how like those simple shot drinks, like a lemon drop or something. I was thinking of doing it like that. But again, I didn't have any luck uh, getting them because I went the Walmart I went to didn't have them. I should have just gone to my store. And so this week, instead, I'm adding some um, I'm adding the same concept, but some Calypso lemonade to it, like a shot's worth, and doing it like that. Okay. Yeah, that's that sounds really good. And then I am drinking the the seltzers I bought when we visited Angry Scotsman. The name is Beach Vacation. It's an eight point seven though. Oh, that'll be fun. It's it's not too bad. Eight point eight percent is not too bad. No, I no, I've I've been worse. Um I think I've had like a 10 on the podcast, if I'm not mistaken, or in the eights before. Well, obviously our last episode, I had that 14%. Well, I was, that's obvious. But before that, what do you think your highest was? I think you had an 11 at one point. Um, the, uh, that Belgian, that bottle of Belgian ale that I got for Christmas was also 14%. Yeah. But you were drinking that way differently than you were drinking those, uh, uh, beer that, that four pack. Yeah. But I was still doing them in like sips. So yeah, but y- the difference was, is you weren't in, you were behind the wheel normally. <laughs> I was behind the wheel. That That's true. That is, that is 100%. I did that last episode. I had a lot of opportunities to drink on my own. Too. So Derek, you ready to get into the rules for this week? Oh, of course. Here in our illustrious society, we abide by an ever-changing set of rules. Rule number one. Every time somebody does something cynical in our story for personal ambition, we take a sip. Rule number two, every time Peter the Hermit pops up again, we'll take three sips. And then rule number three, every time a group of crusaders massacre a group of people who are not Muslim, we take a shot. And we also start out, before we get into the story, with a shot. You ready, Derek? Of course, Prost. Ooh. Oh, that's a way to do a Tuesday night. You ready to get into this, Tim? For our listeners, uh, you probably figured out we are going to be talking about a crusade in this episode. Tim, I want to ask you real quick, what is your like overall impression? Like, What do you know about the crusades generally? I actually don't know a whole lot about spe- the specific crusades. I know a very little about the crusaders the the religious organization but that's about it okay yeah so 
what what generally in, what is your impression of like what happened in the crusades just very very broadly whatever it is that you know um the christians went full zealot and started doing a bunch of really heinous shit that's that's actually fair that's uh not that's not far off um i will say the zealotry part i think is a little overblown um but we'll we'll get into it so generally speaking uh most people's impression of like your average everyday person who's not super interested in history or anything or anything their general impression of the crusades is like a bunch of christian knights heard that uh christians were being oppressed in the holy land in the levant like around like the area around jerusalem and and we're not talking about the bullshit oppression they suffer now which is not oppression right yeah and so these knights at the behest of the pope went went over to the holy land beat uh, the Muslim oppressors and liberated the holy liberated Jerusalem uh, for the for the church. That's the general impression. Whether anybody believes it or not, that's what they've been told, and that's kind of their idea of what the Crusades are. Um, and uh, there's a lot wrong with that, <laughs> uh, as you could uh, as you probably like are figured by now there's a lot of problems with that narrative so this this episode that we're doing today uh it's going to be a little different from normal usually our topics are more biographical looking at a period of history through the eyes of like a single person and their lifetime uh but this time around we're going to be covering the entire event the entirety of specifically the first crusade i was about to say uh i didn't Aren't there like three crusades? If we're going through all of them, that feels like we're skipping up a fuckload. There were seven or eight crusades. Oh God, I was way off. Plus all of the other crusades that happened in places that weren't in the Holy Land or weren't in like the Eastern Mediterranean. There were a bunch of crusades like in Europe. Uh, Like there was one in Southern France. There was one in like what's now Northern Poland. So when did the first crusade kind of take off? Because I, I, I don't even know the differences on each of the crusades. The first crusade kicked off in 1095. So like the very tail end of the 11th century. And the, the last crusade, like the last crusade, the last crusaders were kicked out of the Holy land in 1277 or somewhere around there. So this is like seven or eight distinct campaigns over the course of about, uh, 200 years and we are eventually going to go through as many of them as we can but as a special as a special marking mar- markation point uh for starting like this is what is going to turn out to be like a pretty big project covering the all of our the crusades and hopefully i get to cover some of like the smaller lesser known ones like the i'm sure we'll eventually get there yeah but for our special one anniversary episode Um, We're going to be starting off with the first crusade, what led up to it, what happened, and why the impression that everybody has about it is pretty much bullshit. All right, are you ready? I'm ready for it. Hit me like you're about to strike me with the knowledge of the crusades. Okay. To understand why the first crusade happened, we have to understand what was going on with four groups of people in the 11th century, Western Europeans, the Catholic church in Rome, the Byzantine empire, and the Muslim world in the middle East and North Africa. That sounds like a lot of background. It'll be a little, it's not as much as you actually think. I think I did a pretty good job condensing it, but, um, so Islam first burst into history in the late 600s, the seventh century after the prophet Muhammad had militarily unified the tribes of the Arabian Peninsula. And shortly after his death, his successors launched an enormous military campaign against the Eastern Roman Empire, a.k.a. the Byzantine Empire. The Arab conquests, as they came to be known, gobbled up half of the landmass of the Byzantine Empire within a couple decades and completely wiped the Sassanid Persian Empire off the map. 
And so from Northern Africa, even as far as like as at Spain, like Spain was controlled by Muslim powers for several hundred, almost a thousand years. Uh, but from, from Spain in the West to Persia in the East, the Arabian Peninsula in the South, right up to the gates of Anatolia in the North, the Middle East came under the control completely under the control of various Muslim caliphates and sultanates. This included, of course, the city of Jerusalem and the surrounding area, which is called the Levant. Jerusalem, of course, being the site of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, as well as in Islam, the site where the prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven. That's something I didn't know about uh, Islam, that uh, Muhammad ascended to heaven. Yeah, the... I'm not trying to say I know much about Islam, just... Mm -hmm. No, most a lot of people in America don't know much about. Uh, most, I'm shocked by how many people don't even realize that Allah the, is just the heir. Is literally just the Abrahamic God. Literally, uh, Catholicism, Christianity, and Muslim slash um, Islam are all kind of the same faith, just different takes on it. Yeah, they're all yeah, Christianity, Judaism and Islam. The three the three of the largest religions on the planet, three of the five major religions on the planet all worship the same god. That's like I think it's like 5 5 or 6 billion people on the planet and they all worship the same god. They're just different interpretations of the same god and maybe some differences in scripture and stuff, but it's like a well not just some, like all of their scripture beliefs not are fairly heavily different. Like you could argue um, Mormons, which are, I say, a Christian faith in my mind, but they, they don't really consider themselves the same as Christians. It's also the same God. It's just, oh, God gave them a special book. Right. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> I hate to make this comparison because I know a lot of people would get mad about it, but uh, Muslim, Islam and and Mormonism are kind of like essentially the same thing. Well, they're, yeah, they have very similar roots. It's they expanded on the, they had a great, a great prophet who expanded on the beliefs of existing Christian doctrine and developed a completely new religion out of it. Uh, but yeah. So by the mid 11th century, the mid 10 hundreds, uh, the two primary Muslim powers in the region were the, Arab uh, Fatimid Caliphate, which was based out of Egypt, and the Turkish Seljuk Empire, who controlled an area stretching from Persia to eastern Anatolia, like right up to the borders of the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantines, obviously, were still reckoning with this turn of events 400 years later at the dawn of the 11th century. Holy shit. They were still kind of, they had gone through waves of like expansion and then territorial loss. And they'd go kind of back and forth depending on what the situation was. They were in a downswing in the years leading up to the first crusade. Um, earlier in the century, they had recon reconquered pretty much all of Anatolia under the reign of the emperor Basil II in the earlier part of the century, but uh, their eastern borders were still constantly threatened by the Seljuks. Uh, and after the def after a disastrous defeat against the Seljuks at the Battle of Manzikert in 1071, which is where the emperor, the Byzantine emperor Romanus IV Diogenes was captured, which is the first time in like six or 700 years a Roman emperor had been captured. Damn. After that... Uh, in the following couple decades, the the Turkish the Muslim Turkish tribes were pushing the Byzantine border further and further back into Anatolia until eventually the Byzantines lost control of two of the major cities in that region, Antioch and Nicaea, which, on top of being two prominent like cultural, economic, political hubs, were also two of the most sacred cities in Christianity. While that was happening, the Byzantines' uh, European borders, their borders on the European side, were also constantly being attacked, attacked by a variety of different tribes and kingdoms, including Slavs like the Serbs, uh, nomadic horse people like the Cumans and the Pechenegs, 
and they were suffering from some periodic invasions by a kingdom in southern Italy, which um, this, this is a really this is actually going to be pertinent to the story coming up. Uh, this this kingdom in southern Italy, it was a Norman kingdom. Uh, do you know like who the Normans were? Or, like Nor- have you heard of? I've heard of it, but I don't know anything about it. Yeah. So the Normans were originally Vikings and they, they were Vikings who during the Viking age had raided and conquered lands in Northern France, but where we call Normandy now. And the, the, I mean, even the word Norman, that's literally like North men, Norman, that's where that comes from. But these, these Viking conquerors ended up converting to Christianity, adopting the French language, and kind of integrating themselves into like uh, the French political, like, socio-political system. And over the years developed uh, as, as like knights and like arm, heavily armored cavalry became a big thing in European warfare. They, they became really good, like legendarily good at that kind of warfare they had really really good knights and so they became really heavily valued as mercenaries through that area of the middle ages at one point the pope had actually hired a bunch of norman mercenaries to go and conquer sicily because sicily the the island off of southern italy because that the island had been conquered by a bunch of by several Muslim Arab tri- Arab kingdoms in North Africa. And so the Pope brought in these Norman mercenaries who kicked the, the Arab Muslims out of Sicily and then just decided they were going to stay, conquered all of Southern Italy, like the Southern part of the boot of Italy, and then founded their own kingdom there. And so now you have uh, French, culturally French descendants of Vikings ruling a kingdom in southern Italy fighting against the Roman Empire, who is now Greek. How weird is... Does that seem... That seems really weird to me. It it honestly does. It's like weird to think like, hey, you're this thing, but technically you're this other thing too. Yeah, and it's it's really weird because culturally, they're, like the Normans are culture are still like kind of sort of French, but are still like culturally distinct from other Northern French people. But then uh, they're also different from like like their uh, genetic relatives in like back in like Scandinavia. They're not even anywhere close to them anymore, but they still kind of have there's still some like cultural layover from like their Scandinavian roots, but then they're also partially Frenchified and then they end up in Italy. And so they become a mix of all three. So they're partially Italian, partially Scandinavian, partially French. And it's really bizarre, but also really interesting. Uh, But yeah, so fighting against this Norman kingdom in Southern Italy is how the Byzantines first get exposed to knights. It's where they first find out about how effective knights are on the battlefield because knights were very good. Uh, they, they were really effective on the battlefield. And both the Norman kingdom and knights are both going to, the Byzantine interest in knights are both going to come up again very soon. So back in the Muslim world, despite the headway that the Seljuks were making in Anatolia, the Muslim world was still, was at the time that the Crusades, that the first crusade began, the Muslim world was kind of in the middle of a, crisis period because within like a couple months of each other at the same time in 1092 both the seljuk empire and the fatimid caliphate both of their rulers died at the same time that's interesting yeah and then both of their empires had succession crises that caused like these massive civil wars and these civil wars and and rebellions were that's funny yeah horrible timing (laughs) And so these succession crises and civil wars were still going on. This happened in 1092. The Crusaders arrived in 1096. And so these rebellions and civil wars were still going on. And so they were not in a position to effectively fight back against the Crusader army when it arrived. It's just funny to think about how much coincidence like that happens throughout history. To think how different history would be if... Oh, these little convenient contrivances that sound like they're out of a a freaking book, to be honest. Because at the time, both the Fatimids and especially the Seljuks 
on a good day or if like, on a good day, on a bad day, they could still field an army of like a hundred thousand, 150,000 troops. Uh, the, uh, the crusader army never got above 80,000. And for most of the time it was way smaller than that. Oh, damn. So if either the Fatimids or the Seljuks had been at all stable or able to field a bigger, like a, a size army that they normally could, the first crusade would have, they would have all been slaughtered the second they set foot on Asia in Asia. It, it just would, it would have died in the crib. It wouldn't have happened. But because of this historical coincidence that all of these different things that I'm talking about happen to coincide all at the same time, it's, we got the first crusade out of it. So meanwhile, in Rome, the city of Rome, the Catholic Church was in the middle of a bit of a reform period. Specifically, there's this movement called the Gregorian Reforms, named after Pope, Pope Gregory VII, who was one of the leading voices in the movement. These reforms were an attempt by the Pope and the Vatican to consolidate and expand both the political authority of the church over kings, emperors, and nobility in Europe, basically consolidate the power of the Pope as the ultimate supreme political authority in Europe, as well as the Pope's spiritual authority over all of Christianity to make the Pope like the leader of the entire Christian faith. Damn. The Gregorian reformers believed that the Pope was the ultimate authority over all of the Christian world, including the Church of the Byzantine Empire. That was a bit of a problem for the Byzantines, since they had basically like their own Pope, it, the, the Patriarch of Constantinople. I, I didn't know there was a, anyone that was ever at any point con, considered an allegory for the Pope. Oh, they're, at, when Christianity was first becoming big, they had five Popes. What? Um, they had, well, they weren't all called popes. Only the one in Rome was called the Pope, but. Well, I, I, I assumed they weren't all called popes, but they were obviously comparable positions. Yeah. They were all called, uh, patriarchs. It was a system called the Pentarchy. And, uh, there was one, one in Rome, one in Constantinople, one in Antioch, one in Jerusalem, and one in Alexandria in Egypt. And, uh. After the Muslim conquests, the ones in Alexandria, Jer Jerusalem, and Antioch kind of fell out of influence because now they were under political systems that didn't recognize their political authority. And so the only two left were the one in Constantinople and the one in Rome. And so over, and so over the centuries since then, it had kind of started to turn into fight over who, who had more influence over the Christian faith, who was, who was going to lead the Christian faith. And the Gregorian reformers were the ones who were trying to turn the, the Western, the Latin church in, the West, in Western Europe, based out of Rome, into the ultimate authority over the whole Christian faith. And that didn't sit well with the Byzantines, because obviously they've got their patriarch, they've got their own way of worshiping that is still generally like basically in line with the Roman church, but like they, like they do, instead of doing masses in Latin, they do them in Greek. Uh, they've got a few like minor, uh, like theological differences. And then even, even by the standards of like the zealotry of the middle ages didn't really mean much, but it was this political conflict. And it was, it was more than just a conflict between Ro like the Pope and the patriarch. It was a political, an entire, like sphere of the spiritual and political conflict between the two heads of Christianity led to Pope Leo the ninth to excommunicate the patriarch of Constantinople in 1054, who then excommunicated the Pope back, which led to the great schism, what, what came to be called the great. You're kicked out. No, you're kicked out. Right. They both think that they're the heads of the church. And so they just kick each other out and they just keep going. Like they're still the heads of the church. When that happens, you just end up with two different churches. <laughs> and so that, I mean, basically, yeah, that came to be called the great schism. And to this day, the Roman Latin church and the Eastern Orthodox churches are still separate. And they still hate each other. Uh, it's, it's kind of mellowed out, but it's complicated. 
Yeah, they're they're still not gonna reunify, but they're not like trying to kill each other anymore, so that's good. I, I think it's pa- like I think we've long evolved past the reunification process, to be honest. Maybe, but there are like there are some groups that are like, yeah, we might as well reunify. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that's uh, if if you argue that like it's been so long is what I'm getting at. If you say that, well, you could reunify uh mormons and christians you can reunify islam and christians like it, it's you know what i mean well i don't i don't think it's that extreme because the actual uh the actual differences in both the theology and the practice between the roman catholic and the eastern orthodox churches are very are a lot more they're a lot closer to each other theologically than say like a catholic and a muslim or like a like a Protestant and a Mormon, they're a lot closer. They're a lot more similar. Okay, it's most mostly like it's mostly aesthetic differences. It's uh, the Eastern the Eastern Orthodox Church still uses Greek and sometimes like Russian in their masses, whereas the the Catholic Church their main language is still Latin. Uh, the Eastern Church is still like a big part of their worship is the use use of icons like uh like portraits of Christ or Ma- of uh Mary or the saints and things like that um but other than that there's a few the the few theological differences there are like I think they have a difference about like what what purgatory is or something like that and I think that's like the big major one uh, that's something that could you get one one good ecumenical council with a bunch of people a bunch of theologians acting in good faith and you can knock that out in like a year okay i think even today i think most of the division still is still mostly just political and geographic than really like theological okay uh, i obviously just assumed that the there the differences were a lot more than they were i guess because you know more about it than i do uh, evidently if you if you actually if a catholic goes to a mass like an orthodox mass in greece or in russia uh they'll more or less generally be able to follow along because they still kind of structure their masses the same way it's still very close to each other and they use a lot of the same prayers still too i mean they still like the big one, like the very basis of their faiths is the Nice Nicene Creed, which is the creed that was decided at the Council of Nicaea. Um, it's still the basis of both of their faiths, and that's like the bedrock. The Nicene Creed is like the basic bedrock orthodoxy of their theology and their teachings, and they're still they still share that. So so the Pope's desire to expand his temporal power had it during this this deck like around the 1080s it took on a new urgency in the decade leading up to the first crusade because at that time at that time the pope was actually in exile from rome what yeah uh because there was a conflict going on between the pope and the king of germany henry the 4th who was also the holy roman emperor and this this conflict was over the right of kings and nobility to appoint bishops because up to that point bishops would be appointed and invested by their local uh lord like their their duke or their king or their emperor or whoever and the church as part of these gregorian reforms was trying to take that power away from them and invest it into uh the church itself and that was a problem for a lot of nobility because um, because it gave a lot of nobility a lot of control over church-owned lands within their domains. And so the church was trying to take control of like direct, basically like trying to take direct control over a bunch, all of this church land, which previously was kind of, even though it was owned by the church and the taxes on it went to the church, it was still controlled and managed by the local Lord. And that was, that became such a huge problem, especially in Germany with uh, Henry the fourth, that it broke out into like a civil war within the Holy Roman empire, which then spilled out into Italy when Henry led an army and invaded Northern Italy 
occupied Rome and installed his own pope. And so the legitimate pope was forced to flee and he was hanging out in like southern Italy at the time. So they had two popes at the time. Dang. I didn't know anything about that. I'm I'm not versed enough to know much about that anyway, to be fair, though. Yeah, that having two popes, like one pope and one anti-pope, became a really common thing in the in the centuries after this. But this is like one of the early instances of that happening. And it was really weird at the time. This so the crusade, this first crusade was in one respect, it was kind of an attempt to mobilize Western nobility under the Pope's authority at a time when his authority was very vulnerable. Okay. If that makes sense. So it I'll explain it a lot more. So and then meanwhile, in Western Europe, things were booming. Shit was going great. The economy was exploding. Trade was blossoming. There was a level of political stability which had not been seen in Western Europe for about 200 years at this point. Damn. Yeah, not since Charlemagne had it been this stable in Europe. And there was a distinct lack of like major wars or conquests or expansions or anything like that. It was very, very safe. Well, I wouldn't say safe because of what I'm about to mention, but it there was not a lot of a lot of land changing hands. Uh, feudalism. This was the heyday of feudalism. Is when it got really entrenched in Europe. Uh, kings, dukes, the occasional emperor or two. They ruled over their lands through con- contractual obligations from the no- the noblemen under them. And basically, these lower lords were allowed to own lands and titles and hold political power within their respective area as long as they pledge to serve the Lord over them in times of war. You know, I think most people generally understand what feudalism is. Um, Many of these lower nobility were part of a military caste, like this class of professional soldiers that we, of course, know are knights. That's who knights are. And knights, of course, they trained in fighting and strategy and war, all aspects of warfare from a very early age so that they could better be warriors for their lords whenever that time came. But despite the relative stability of this period, there's still a good deal of violence going on. I, I just, isn't that just the time as well? Or is this more violence than for the time? I'd say there's, it's like, oh, I don't know. There there were lots of different violent times in, uh, within the Middle Ages in Europe, but they were, they, they would all be caused by like different things and take different. Well, so I, I obviously don't have as good of context on history, but, and I obviously know it's not literally all conflict and violence, but the middle ages from what I understand were very violent and conflict driven. Like, um, in some periods, uh, like, like the period immediately after Charlemagne, like when the Carolingian empire collapsed in like the mid to late eight hundreds, that was a very violent time. Um, in fact, that's where knights come from because they needed a whole class of like professional warriors to be able to fight all the wars that were going on. But then you also have periods like to some extent this, but also later in like the 1200s uh, where you don't have a lot of wars going on and there might be, at least you don't have like a lot of major wars going on and it's too complex for our current topic to get into the weeds because you haven't prepared. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there's a lot of socio political, economic, uh, material conditions, all that kind of stuff to go into to kind of describe why certain areas, but, but just in broad strokes, there were some parts of the Middle Ages which were very violent, and there were some which were just kind of like I would even call them like any more violent than we are today. Okay. And this period, if it weren't for all of these knights, uh, would be one of those times when it was just like there wasn't a lot going on and there wasn't a lot of like, ma- there weren't any major wars and everything was just kind of stable and, you know, kind of just going fine. 
um, what makes this period unique for the violence that's going on is that it's um, the lack of large wars was causing all of these knights who had been preparing their whole lives uh, to just get bored. So these guys are trained basically from birth to be warriors, to fight on the battlefield and to resolve their differences using conflict, to pick up a sword and uh, go solve your problems with a duel, that kind of thing. And so you, all of these knights, they didn't have an outlet for like all of their training and they, they just didn't have anything to do. And so it, it was causing a lot of them to kind of fight amongst themselves. There were a lot of, um, sometimes it would just be like individual duels. They would just fight and kill each other over like petty individual differences. Sometimes it kind of escalate into like a, a local, like, like they get a band of guys and each of them would get like, go like get their posses or their retinues and they'd go and fight like a little mini battle somewhere. And it end up killing a bunch of innocent people in the process that was happening a little bit. Another major thing that was happening was that, uh, some of these knights would just kind of, they just go into, and this is wild. I can't believe this actually happened. This is, this is never mentioned when talking about this period or talking about knights. A lot of these guys would just go into like a village or like, like a peasant communal village or something like that and just start raping and slaughtering and looting the place and just burn it down just, just because they could. And nobody would, nobody, they didn't ever, never face consequences for it because they were, they were nobility and the people they were killing were commoners. So they, they don't have any political rights. So who cares? So there's a lot of that kind of stuff. And that was a big problem because obviously that's going to cause a little bit of insta instability. So despite the fact that, so the political stability of the time was inadvertently because of the presence of all of these knights contributing to its own destabilization because it's kind of hard to run a society when you have this entire group of people who literally only live to kill people. Yeah. I mean, if you just think about it logically, it makes sense. Even if you want to take the like context of like, well, they were just horrible people. Like, no, people are just going to, if you're raised up to fight, you're going to fight. Yeah. And so, and so this was, this had the potential to cause like a major, like lack a loss of faith in the social system, the existing social system of Western Europe, which was bad for the church because the church needed faith in the, needed the nobility to be in power to protect their authority. And the, the nobility needed the church to protect their authority. And so, so all of these knights going out and causing people to lose faith in the, no, the nobility and, lose faith in the church was going to cause the entire social fabric to eventually start to fray. Does that make sense? Yeah. It sounds like they had a system that was eroding itself on essentially. Yes. Some popes up to this point had tried to mitigate all of this violence by directing these knights towards wars going on in like the periphery of Europe, especially directed towards non-Christians like the Muslim kingdoms, which are now a central part of the geopolitics of the Mediterranean, uh, a lot of them they directed towards the Iberian Peninsula, aka like modern day Spain and Portugal, which at the time was partially controlled by uh, Muslim emirates. And of course, like I mentioned before, also brought some of them into Sicily to kick out the Arab the Arab. Uh, Arab kingdoms who had conquered Sicily and parts of southern Italy, and like I like I mentioned, that resulted in the formation of this Norman Norman kingdom in southern Italy. And the the last last thing I'll say before it, as we get into the actual events, is that at the time there was this weird this weird buzz kind of going on in Christian Europe and like the the Christian European zeitgeist if that makes sense. Like just the, the public consciousness, the psyche. That's kind of the political landscape, the, the, the feel of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it had to do with, it was kind of based on the after effects of losing so many sacred sites to the Christian faith, to uh, the Muslim world. 
for centuries, even after the Muslim takeover, the Holy Land and Jerusalem had been a site of pilgrimage for Christians around the world. And in the 11th century, thousands of Christian pilgrims still traveled to Jerusalem and other areas of the Levant every year to worship at biblical sites. The Muslim states who controlled Jerusalem freely accepted Christian pilgrims. So the Muslim states who controlled Jerusalem freely accepted Christian pilgrims and nine times out of 10 actually treated them really well. So this is, an, this is another big myth about the Crusades is that, is that the Muslims were oppressing Christians in the Holy Land when in reality um, they treated Christians like pretty decently, not, not as good as they treated like their fellow Muslims, but like, like Christian pilgrims who came through, like pilgrimages were basically like the medieval version of tourism. Like a lot of money came into the local economy whenever pilgrims came through because they spent money when they came and they could be taxed when they came. And on top of that, the Christians who did live under Muslim areas, uh, you were, these rule, these Muslim rulers were actively by their own faith disincentivized from persecuting them or from forcing them to convert or, or expelling them or anything like that. Because in, in the Quran, according to the teachings of Islam, you can, uh, you can charge an extra tax on non-believers within your lands. And so, and so oppressing Christians only ended in them losing revenue to the state. And so they actively had an incentive to treat Christians decently well. Interesting, and so that was that was that was a big a major myth, and it was a belief at the time. It it was a big motivating factor for why the Crusades happened was this belief that. Um, so it's more of a false sense, just like today too. That so I w- I was actually kind of far off when I said they were completely different. Yeah, yeah. There is there is like this there is sort of this psychological sense of persecution that is intrinsic to like the Catholic faith, which or the Christian faith generally, because of course, like a, you, I, I wish we would, would be able to have like a more like educated talk on it, but I don't have enough context to like actually discuss in a deep one, but it, it's almost like from the founding Christianity has had this uh, PTSD slash prosecution pl- uh, complex that they have to be perceive everything that's going wrong around them as being taken advantage of or being prosecuted. Yeah. And that, that mentality made sense in like the early, like the first couple centuries of Christianity's existence when they were actually genuinely persecuted by the state and they were massacred and publicly tortured and things like that. Doesn't make a lot of sense when they're the dominant cultural and political force over like 60% of the planet. It makes no fucking sense today. But it still sticks around because it's so intrinsic to Christian theology. Christian theology is in hugely focused on uh, humility and the idea of this is how you behave when you're being persecuted. There's no matching Christian theology on what to do when you actually have power. They can't comprehend what it's like to be a Christian in power, so they can only see Christianity through the lens of being a persecuted minority, even when they are the ones in power. And they've been in power for a long time. Yeah, they've been in power for, at least over like our cultural heritage, have been in power for 1800 years. And been in power over a bulk of the world for like, of the entire planet for like 500 years. Like, and it's crazy because there are some areas of the world that where Christians are still persecuted. Syria a bunch of a bunch of Christians have been persecuted in Syria. Um, just a few decades ago, Turkey was persecuting Christians. Um, uh, North Korea has persecuted Christians. China's persecuted Christians. North Korea makes entirely too much sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, they well they prosecute any religion. To be honest, uh, that one's that one's weird. Yeah, they they persecute any religion. But there are areas of the world. Um, where Christians are persecuted. The place where Christians feel the most persecuted, like the United States or Europe, are not the places where they are persecuted. No, not at all. Uh, anyways, um, 
So, like I said, during the years leading up to the First Crusade, there was a period of instability in the Middle East, and the, the Muslim sultans and caliphs were becoming less and less able to actually use their militaries to defend all of these Christian pilgrims that were coming into the Holy Land. And so, as a result, a lot of these pilgrims started suffering from more and more bandit attacks. And they were being robbed or they were being swindled. And in some cases, like entire groups of uh, pilgrims would be massacred. At, in some instances, like a couple of really famous ones, 500 or more pilgrims were all wiped out by bandits. Oh, damn. And, these ma- and so news of these massacres would make it back to Europe. The rumor mill would take off, uh, get mixed up in a giant game of telephone, and it would turn from... Uh, turned from uh, bandits are killing pilgrims in the Holy Land to to Christians are being killed in the Holy Land to Muslims are oppressing Christians in the Holy Land. And it got all all the rumors would get more and more lurid. And you had these stories about... Because of course they would, because that's exactly how that works. Right. And so you get these stories about like women being, uh, about children being sold into slavery and women being caged and tortured and all, all for all because they're Christians, that, that kind of thing. And so there were all at that time, there was like this buzz in the air about like, what, what are we going to do? How are we going to respond to this? How are we going to address God's faithful being persecuted in the land of Christ's death and resurrection? What, what are we going to do about it? We got to do something about it. And so all of this stuff I'm talking about is the situation that the Mediterranean world was in. Leading up to the crusade. Right. When in March of 1095, the Byzantine emperor, Alexios I Komnenos, sent an envoy to Rome to ask Pope Urban II for aid in trying to push the Seljuks out of Anatolia. Alexios was asking for around 10,000 Western knights to come to Anatolia, join his army of shock cavalry, and help him recapture the cities of Nicaea and Antioch. So this is the request. This is what kicks all of the, this is the first domino push. This is basically the straw that broke the camel's back. Mm -hmm. And so Pope Urban, the reformer, the exile from Rome, he had this unique situation where he had the problem of the knights who were undercutting stability in Christian society with their violence the outrage in the Christian world at the violence being done at Christians on sacred soil and the, the potential to, he he had this thought of maybe like the Greek and Latin churches could reunite through mutual cooperating cooperation, fighting Muslim nations. And all of this was shaping up to be a good situation where he could push his power around as Pope a little bit and create a situation where he became more of like a political, uh, like a politically important and politically authoritative figure. So he, he, he was looking for, he, it was a power grab. Yes, it was a power grab. I think that's a, a sip, right? Every time something, somebody does something cynical for personal ambition, sip. So yeah, he's got this whole, he's got all his ducks in a row. He's got this idea that if nothing else, he now, he can make like this, this army that he can go and send off to fight in infidels, fight the Saracens in the Middle East. And through that, uh, justify his own like temporal power, his own political power. Because if you've got an army, you've got political power. And a crusader army would be an army of the Pope, at least in theory. And so, so Urban, when he heard this, he, when he got this envoy, he went on this recruiting tour for, and started talking to local lords and, and princes and knights and uh, kind of gathering interest in the idea of creating a giant Christian army that would go over and push the saracens out of christian holy sites i've you've heard the word saracens right before right absolutely fucking not okay saracen is uh i wouldn't call it a slur it it was it might have been used as a slur at some point but it's it's the slang term that uh that uh crusaders used to describe the muslim warriors that they were fighting 
they called them the Saracens. So whenever I say Saracens, I mean the the Muslim armies. Okay. Because that's that's the wording that they would have used. So he goes on this recruiting tour, starting in southern Italy, going all the way up north into southern France. And this all culminated in a speech that he gave in the town of Clermont, which was in the Duchy of Aquitaine in southern France. Uh, there was a crowd of thousands of clergy and noblemen gathered. He gave this impassioned, fiery speech about the plight of the followers of the true faith in the East who are under the boot of the oppressive Saracens. He called for the knights of Christian lands to end their petty infighting and instead take up the cross. And this, this is how he described it, quote unquote, take up the cross and go on, quote unquote, an armed pilgrimage. So back then, they, they did not have the word crusade yet. What what was happening here? What they were describing? They called they thought, saw it as a pilgrimage. They were going on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, but they would have swords and spears and arrows. At this point, it's not called crusading yet. They're not called crusaders. They don't have that word yet. I kind of assumed the term came along later rather than come along right at the beginning. Yeah, I think I think they would. I think they would have it by the Second Crusade, but uh, but it came from. The term crusade comes from the phrase taking up the cross. Okay, I didn't know that. And so he also, Pope Urban also said that anybody who undertook this armed pilgrimage would, quote unquote, receive rewards in heaven. Same thing happened. Game of telephone. The receive rewards in heaven slowly morphed into, uh, if you die while you're fighting in this crusade, all of your sins are going to be forgiven. (laughs) Of course they did. Which is not what he said. <laughs> he never made that promise. Um, according to one, according to one source, uh, he he said to have whipped this crowd at Claremont into such a frenzy that uh, they began to shout the Latin phrase, which is now famous associated with the Crusade, "Deus lo volt," or "God wills it." And now you hear, you, you know the. I've never heard that before. Deus volt. Deus volt. Deus volt. Yeah, that's 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 a very famous uh, phrase associated with the crusade. Deus volt. God wills it. Uh, but it might be apocryphal. It might not be. We have a few different versions of the speech that were all written by guys who were at the. All they we have like five different version. All of the guys who wrote these different versions were almost definitely at the speech probably just remembered them different ways. It, it was probably that he was saying stuff in a vague way that played up to people's sense of desire and they interpreted it completely differently. That's possible too. Yeah. And so the message of this speech spread like wildfire throughout Western Europe. Lots and people kept hearing that if you go on this crusade, all your sins are going to be forgiven. And so that got a lot of people very excited because, you know, people were concerned about that. <laughs> Um, and so they had a lot of very ready and eager recruits. And I don't know about back then. This might be an interesting discussion. I know today getting your sins forgiven is kind of seen as a, like a free pass to do whatever the fuck you want to sin, basically. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I've never because in growing up Catholic, we had to go to confession like like once a month or whatever. And I forget you're not a. You're not used to the stereotypical Christian raising. Knights and princes from all across France, Germany, Italy, and the Low Countries, which is basically like the Low Countries are like uh, uh, the Netherlands and Belgium. That's what they're called. Okay. Knights and princes from all across Western Europe began packing up their armor, practicing their sword work in preparation. But before they could get off, Somebody else beat them to the punch. The first crusader army to ever exist was not an army of knights. It wasn't? It was not. Here we introduce Father Peter the Hermit. Ah, sip. That's uh, three sips. Three sips. He's first introduced. Mm -hmm. Peter the Hermit is one of the greatest con men of all time. Oh, really now? I love Peter the Hermit. He is one of the most fascinating and funny characters from history ever. He is so 
like he is he is like the comic relief but to a real life historical event it is so fun he just he does not matter but he keeps popping up and i it it's so funny when he does because it's always doing something ridiculous or causing problems and he becomes the he this guy is the very first general of a crusader army in history a priest named peter the hermit who had been zealously spreading the message of armed pilgrimage throughout eastern france and west germany gathering hordes of peasants to his banner wherever he went the common folk were whipped up into a frenzy and began following him without question often only grabbing a pitchfork or a sickle as a weapon on their way out not any food or anything they'd need for the long trip to the middle east just whatever they had on their back they just leave this is and this is where it starts to suck Uh, In their religious fervor, these newly minted crusaders, the very first act they do as a unified group of crusaders is they launch the largest largest pogroms against Jewish people in European history up to that point. Have you heard heard that word before, pogrom? No, I just repeat it for no stinking reason, Derek. Okay. Fuck me, God. A pogrom is a... um, Basically, it's when a riot turns into a massacre of like an ethnic minority. Okay. Oh, well, it's particularly of a minority. Yeah. Um, if you heard of uh, Kristallnacht, the it was uh, in right after the Nazis came to power. There was this one night where towns all across Germany uh, had riots, and all of the Jewish people, or a lot of the Jewish like businesses, were. Um, uh, were attacked and um, vandalized or burned down and Jewish people were attacked in the streets and stuff like that. Was there another day involving the brown shirts or something in Germany? Night of the Long Knives. Yeah, that was a different thing. That's that's when that's actually that's actually when the SS uh, liquidated the brown shirts and got rid of them. That's what I'm thinking of. It. Yes, that's that's But yeah, um but pro- pogroms were for cent- for centuries over over a thousand years in European history pogroms were one of the like or the ultimate culmination of like anti-semitic violence towards Jewish communities um basically if there was a lot of anti-semitism in the air then all of the all of the townspeople uh something would set them off and there'd be a riot and the rioters would all travel to the Jewish communities and start burning stuff down and murdering people. Damn. And so the first thing that these newly minted crusaders did was launch the largest pogroms against Jewish people in European history up to that point. But they butchered tens of thousands of Jewish Jewish people. In the Rhineland, the area along the Rhine River in West Germany, almost every single Jewish community was wiped off the map. I think what some of the numbers I've heard that range between like 20 and 50,000 people were murdered. Jesus Christ. Yeah. That was the very first act of violence of the crusades of any crusade. That's also, uh, I think that's a shot. Every time crusaders massacre a group of people who are not Muslim, take a shot. Come by. Prost. After this uh, horde of, anti-Semitic peasants were done slaughtering the entire Jewish community of Western Germany, basically. Uh, In just a few short months, this horde of peasants numbered around 40,000. God. Yeah, 40,000 in just a few months. They set off from the city of Cologne in April of 1096 to go off on their holy war. Keep in mind, Pope Urban's call call to arms was specifically for knights and princes not peasants this army which this this army it came to be called the people's crusade they absolutely did not have the sanction of the church obviously so by the time the this peasant army reached hungary in june which is only a couple hundred miles uh they were already starving and desperate for food and what what happens to a big group, Tim? What happens to a big group of people when they're armed and desperate for food? Uh, they rape and pillage. They rape and pillage. That's exactly what happened. 
everywhere they went, they marauded, they looted farms. They, they were often fighting local military forces in order to get grain. The historical record is a bit hazy, but it's possible that this army might have captured the city, the entire city of Belgrade and looted it for supplies. We actually aren't sure, which is kind of wild because it's an entire city, but, um, but they're just, they're killing they're wiping out like entire villages worth of people. And these people are Christians. Oh my God. That's another shot. Is it? Fuck. I didn't even have my next shot ready. You motherfucker. That's two paragraphs. What the? F- mm. You're really smart about your shots. Aren't you? Oh man. Let me tell you. I thought, I think I did really good on my rolls last week. You're not doing so good. Your first week back, Derek. Eh, whatever. I couldn't care less. Prost. <laughs> Come by. When this uh, crusader army, glorified crusader army, arrived in Byzantine territory, the first place they stopped off was the city of Nice, or Niche, I think, um, which we've actually mentioned in a couple episodes. We mentioned it in the Attila episode and the the St. Uh, Patrick episode. Uh, it's the city of Nyasis, in the former Roman city of Nyasis. It was... Uh, uh, I think you said the wrong name. We haven't done St. Patrick. Not St. Patrick, St. Saint, uh, Saint Nicholas. Yeah, that's what I meant. But Niche used to be the Roman city of Nyasis, which is where the where the first Christian emperor of Rome, Constantine, was born. And it was also one of the major cities that was burned down by Attila. Okay. Yeah, I remember vaguely that. It's been a hot minute, but I vaguely remember that. Yeah, so it's the first city that the this peasant crusader army comes across. Uh, the Byzantine commander uh, who commanded the garrison at Niche knew that this army was dangerous and he didn't want them around his city for very long. And so he offered, he, he went to Peter and he said he offered to escort and supply them all the way to Constantinople as long as they left immediately and did not touch his city. Peter agreed, but he did not have very good control over a giant mob of hungry peasants for some reason. No, I would have never guessed. And so as they were leaving, as they were heading out, uh, some of the peasants got into an argument with a local mill owner over the price of grain they burned his mill to the ground the burning the burning mill caused chaos amongst the army and they started a riot and started looting and pillaging all through the countryside again (laughs) oh it was just like domino after domino (laughs) yeah and so the commander of the garrison at niche sent out his his detachment of his detachment of troops to go out and push them out. There was a giant battle. 10,000 peasants were killed. Oh, good God. A quarter of their army was killed. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Derek here just laughing at cat mass murder. I know, this is the... The Crusades are... I, I did not emphasize this when we started, but I need to say it now. The Crusades are some of the dumbest things that have ever happened in human history. Some of the most stupid shit that human beings have ever done happened during the Crusades. And it it, it, it did involve mass death, but it was still like just brain dead shit like this. Sounds like it. And so this peasant army, they set back out, now down to 30,000. They met another Byzantine army detachment, and this time they were able to get proper escort to Constantinople, and they arrived at They arrived at the gates on August 1st. It's estimated that in this trip from Germany to Constantinople, they killed between five and 6,000 people. Holy God. Emperor Alexios was understandably dumbfounded. Okay. (laughs) That is, yeah, that is, he asked for 10,000 armored knights, and instead he got 30,000 starving peasants led by a shifty priest. I, I think that's the reasonable take to be. He also knew that they had already murdered a few thousand of his subjects, and if he didn't do something soon, they would start up again. So 
he told Peter that it was a bad idea for them to go fighting the Turks right now and recommended that they turn their force around, go and join the main force of crusaders, you know, all the knights and the, the princes and the people who know how to fight and go and join them and then come back with them when they're ready. But Peter and his followers were having none of it. They were ready to go kill Saracens and they were ready to go see the Holy Land. So Alexios just decided, fuck it, let them die in Anatolia. And so he shipped all 30,000 of them across the Bosphorus Strait on August 6th and just let them go out into... <laughs> Uh, as soon as they landed on the shore, they figured, oh, we're in Muslim territory now. We can start raiding again because now we're not now we're not going to be killing Christians, not realizing that the other coastline was still Byzantine territory. <laughs> of course they did. And so they started raiding again. <laughs> By this point, what little control Peter still had over the army was now just gone. And so as a dark prelude to what will actually come later, the, the Crusader army started to bicker. The bickering was mainly between the French, German, and Italian portions of the army. And so just out of disagreement, they ended up splitting in half. The Germans went off and did their, started doing their own thing. In September, 6,000 German Crusaders went and actually cap they captured a city. They're making some headway. They captured the city of Zeriord. Or how the fuck do you? Uh, Why did I expect you to say they captured the wrong city? Well, they, there is no wrong city. They're just like you. You always have to capture a few cities on the way through the. No, I was meaning more in the sense they captured like their own side or something like that. Oh yeah, that'd be funny. <laughs> no, they they did capture a Seljuk controlled or a I guess not technically Seljuk, just a Turkish control, but. They captured the city of, I think it's pronounced Zeriyrdos. It's it's in Greek, so the G is silent and it starts with an X. So I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it, but I think it's Zeriyrdos. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then after they entered the city, they were immediately besieged by Turkish troops and were forced to surrender. Just like that. 6,000. So that's another 6,000 down. Some of them were forced to convert to Islam and it ended up being deported to Persia. The rest of them who refused to convert were massacred. Um, af af after that happened, Peter, who by this point had, like I said, zero control or authority over this whole situation, he said that he was going to go back to Constantinople to arrange for delivery of supplies from Alexios. So he left and did not come back. Can you blame him at this point, though? <laughs> it sounds like everything's been an epic fail. Yeah. <laughs> On October 21st, at this point, there's about 20,000 of these guys left. So on October 21st, the remaining 20,000 Crusaders set off towards the city of Nicaea, which, of course, you know, that's the first major target. You're you got your three three major targets are Nicaea, Antioch, Jerusalem. So they're on their way to knock the first one off the list. On their way, they were ambushed by a Turkish army at the Battle of Civitat, which is kind of kind of cruel to call it a battle. It was not a battle, but uh, they were completely surrounded and they were destroyed. Of the original forty thousand who set off from Germany, three thousand made it back to Europe. So that that is. The very first Crusader army of all time. That is how they ended. Wow. That's not even like technically the first crusade though, is it? That's like the preamble, I guess. That Yeah, that's that's kind of how it's treated by historians. It's the preamble to the first crusade. It's crusade zero. <laughs> right. So, yeah, so that that is. Uh, but don't don't fret. Don't despair. Our good pal, Peter the Hermit, will be back soon. Oh, I would have never guessed considering he's in the rules. So while all of this is happening, uh, there were four main crusader armies that that had had kind of built up organically back home in different areas. And this this one was a good proper fighting force. They had their knights. They were led by princes who were who were 
like veteran generals. They had their footmen at arms that were properly armed, properly trained and armored, all that kind of stuff. The the good, we're getting into the real crusade here. The genuine article, you could say. And this army was, is, historians refer to this one as the Prince's Crusade to contrast it with the People's Crusade. Quick question. I know we're only covering the First Crusade, but does each crusade have like a kind of a title or? Um, not normally. Sometimes they'll have like, a, they'll have, sometimes they'll either be referred to as like the, like the order crusade they're in like the third fourth fifth crusade or they'll be referred to as the crusade of the year that that it started are there any other crusades that have a title like the princes or crusade like the first crusade does there is one later that is called the the children's crusade i'm guessing because children got slaughtered or are involved that's the story it's complicated though what is not complicated in history? It might have been the popular story about the children's crusade is that it was a bunch of children. What actually probably happened was that it was a mistranslation because in old French, uh, the word for chill child and the word for peasant were very, very similar. And so it might've just been another peasant's crusade, uh, but they're not, sh they're not sure. It probably involved a lot of children either way. Okay. That's the only one I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I think, I don't know. I'd have to look it up. I, there might be a couple more, but that's the only ones you remember offhand. So that's all that really matters now, at the moment. I'm sure eventually we'll find out in the future when you cover the other crusades. Yeah. I think there might be one called like the Albigensian campaign or the Albigensian crusade or something like that. I think it was like the one in Southern France, I think had a name. It was a crusade against like a, a her heretical, like, like, like splinter faith that was declared a heresy. And there was like a crusade against them in Southern France. So yeah, now we've got the, the princess crusade. The good This crusade had a lot of commanders and a lot of guys in charge. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's run down. Don't worry about remembering all of these names. I'll, I'll help you. I'll remember for you and I'll re-explain who they are whenever they come along. But these, you couldn't get me to remember names if my life depended on it, Derek. So go for it. So the popes, the Pope picked out two guys that he wanted to lead this crusade, uh, a military leader and a spiritual leader. So the military guy he got was the Raymond, the fourth, who is the count of Toulouse from, it's just a guy from France. And, for spiritual leadership, he appointed Bishop Adamar of Lapuy. So literally a bishop. So those were supposed to ostensibly the two main leaders, the two commanders of the C Crusader army. Okay. And then some of the other major players you're going to get, some the important names that you're going to have to know. Godfrey of Bouillon and his brother Baldwin of Boulogne who led a contingent from Northern France and Flanders, uh, Raymond of Toulouse, who led the, uh, who led the sub, the, fr the French forces from the South. Oh, wait, I already mentioned him. Yeah. Uh, Raymond, the fourth of Toulouse. Uh, and then the, the last names, uh, Bohemond of Toronto and his nephew Tancred, who were from the Norman kingdom in South Italy. And, that last guy I mentioned, Bohemond, he's going to cause a lot of problems. <laughs> Bohemond, he was the the lord who ruled over the Nor Norman kingdom in southern Italy. And he had been fighting the Byzantine Empire since he was a teenager. He hated the Byzantines. Like, with a... And already from the very beginning, he's already figuring out like what ostensibly this crusade is to help the Byzantines. And he is already calculating like, what am I going to have to be doing to make sure that I fuck over the Byzantines to the best of my ability <laughs> from the very beginning. And so our ragtag group of princes and knights set off on in August of 1096, just as the just as the People's Crusade is arriving in uh, Anatolia. They set off in August. 
And it, sometime in September, they are, all arrive are kind of around, generally around the same time. It was pretty well planned. They kind of arrive at the same time at the gates of Constantinople about a month later. To their shock, Alexios was for some reason less than eager to see them. <laughs> probably had something to do with the fact that the last crusader army had murdered thousands of his subjects on the way through. <laughs> on top of that, uh, Bohemond was with them, who was, like I said, one of the Byzantine Empire's greatest enemies. So Alexios didn't trust these guys. I wonder why. And this, this was a pretty intimidating group. These were all like pretty well-trained, well-veteran like heavily armored warriors. There were about 80,000 of them at this point. Uh, don't get comfortable with that number. This is the biggest they're ever going to be. <laughs> I probably wouldn't remember the numbers anyway. So the 80,000 guys, all very pious, very zealous, and very eager to go and start killing some Muslims, had to just sit around and wait for Alexios to let them through. It had to wait for the their commanders to negotiate, which took several months. And while they were waiting, uh, a whole bunch of problems arose between the Crusaders and the locals. Um, a couple riots broke out because the uh, the Crusaders claimed that the locals were trying to uh, were using extortionary pricing on for food and stuff. Um, so it was, it's getting to be a problem, but finally, after several months of negotiation, Alexios finally agreed that he would ferry the army across the Bosphorus Strait and that he would provide, uh, he would provide what military support he could and supplies, uh, for them on their campaign after they crossed in exchange all of the leaders, all of the commanders of the crusade had to swear fealty to Alexios, essentially say that for the time being, they are vassals to Alexios and that any land that they captured in the crusade would be returned to the Byzantine empire. So they wouldn't get to keep any of it. They wouldn't, this was, this wasn't supposed to be conquest. This was supposed to be, um, retaking lost Byzantine, lost Christian land. Well, that was the idea. And so in early 1097, the first crusade finally set foot in Asia. And who should they encounter when they arrive? But our old friend, Peter the Hermit. <laughs> the first guy they encounter on the, on the other side. I'm going to go ahead and take my three sips. Well, he came and he gave a pitch basically saying, hey, I should be a commander in this army too. <laughs> his, his pitch was that he was the only... <laughs> he had already fought... What? <laughs> ...against the Turks. And so they needed his expertise. Did it work? They they did not give him command, but they did bring him on as a spiritual advisor. <laughs> so yeah, now now Father Peter is on board. The Crusaders, as they start to wander around, getting the lay of the land, figuring out where their first target is going to be, they are pretty surprised when they realize that there are no Turkish armies around here. There's no there's nobody there to like fight them off. They don't know why. They're not gonna. They're not gonna look a ghost gift horse in the mouth, or they're not gonna look a gift horse in the mouth. Yeah, not a ghost horse, a gift horse. Um, so they they don't know why, but they're not gonna question it. But as it turns out, so there's this guy. He's the so the Turkish state in Anatolia is called the Sultanate of Rum, and Rum is just the Turkish word for Rome. It's literally the Sultanate of Rome. Never heard that title before. Uh, yeah, it's just the little Turkish. It's the little Turkish state that got carved out of Anatolia once they pushed the Byzantines back, um, and it was being led by this guy named Kilij Arslan, K I L I J A R S L A N, Kilij Arslan, uh, which is a. It was a complicated name to kind of figure out how to pronounce, even semi coherently. Um, so Sultan Arslan, uh, 
basically he was the guy who led the troops that had defeated the people's crusade that had crushed them. And so after he crushed them, he was like, well, well, I just, I just killed like, like what? 30,000 people, like 25 or 30,000 people here. Surely like that must, that must be it for here. Like my job here is done. Might as well go deal with some other stuff. And so he left with his whole army to go deal with another uprising that was happening in his lands. What? And so they were out. So he was out in Eastern Anatolia with his whole army. He was nowhere near where the crusaders had landed because he thought that he had already beat the crusaders. Wow. (laughs) And uh, his, his capital city, he had actually made his capital city at Nicaea, which was of course their first target. And so his whole family and his whole royal treasury were all wide open and essentially undefended. And so with no army to stop them, the Crusaders, in May of 1097, they go and they besiege Nicaea. So, so far so good, it seems. So when Arslan receives word of what is happening, he swings his army around and goes and he attacks the Crusader army on May 16th. And he didn't bring his whole army because he didn't think he'd need them because of how easy it was to beat the last group of crusaders. So now he comes back, he gets his ass kicked and sent off. How hard does he get his ass kicked, sir? Oh, I don't have the exact numbers, but he loses like a quarter of the forces that he sent to fight, to fight them. I think like a, something like a quarter of his whole army gets wiped out. Um... So he got beat pretty bad. But again, he wasn't using his whole army. Um, But for the time being, uh, Crusaders have him off their ass. But they were having problems with besieging Nicaea. They found that they weren't able to starve the city out because the city was situated on the banks of a lake. And so the city was able to receive fresh supplies by boat, and they didn't have enough troops to encircle the entire lake to keep any supplies from coming through. And so to solve that, uh, Alexios, Byzantine emperor, uh, helps them out, has all of, all of the ships that he used to uh, ferry them over the Bosphorus Strait. He has all of those ships grounded on the beach, and then starts rolling them towards Nicaea on logs. Wow. Okay. An entire an entire fleet. This is like this is like a couple hundred ships. On oh, a couple hundred ships on logs. That sounds like a book thing. That doesn't sound like that actually happened in history. It act it actually. It it's kind of crazy because it only takes like a month to get them to Nicaea. But Nicaea is also kind kind of relatively close to the coast. What kind of troops are they rocking at this point? Uh, who the Crusaders? Yeah, the ones rolling the ships up is what I mean. Oh, the the ones rolling the ships—they're just workers. Like they're just they're just like Greek Byzantine laborers. They're not soldiers or anything. Like, what kind of gr- workforce are they talking though? Do you know? Because that had to be like massive. I I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm history doesn't record like. The people who like the people who are rolling the locks, unfortunately. Damn it, because that's crazy. <laughs> they they probably had a lot of people. It wouldn't have been like some Herculean feat. I mean, that's the whole point of the logs is to make it easier. Um, but you want to know the worst part? Hit me. I'm sure I'm not ready though. They got all of the ships to Nicaea and then ended up not needing them. <laughs> the reason for that was because. Uh, Um, As soon as the garrison of the city saw the boats on the horizon being carried over land on logs, um, they immediately surrendered. (laughs) Just that intimidating force, like, I've come to kick your ass. I surrender, sir, I surrender. This is looking at like, well, there goes our fucking food. All right, you get the city. Yeah, so that, that was on June 18th. So that was, that was a couple months. Sticking with the vow that they gave to Alexios, uh, they did not loot the city. They did not kill anybody in the city. And the city was safely delivered back into Byzantine hands. So 
So that's that's a third of the mission done. They're a couple months in. That's a third of the mission done. So far, so good. Let let let's uh let's see if it uh, keeps going so well, so good for them. I'm assuming it doesn't. <laughs> it gets so bad. It's, it gets so so bad. Um. So if I don't know if you recall from our Alexander episodes, but uh, this probably not. You'll have to remind me. Once you get past the coast in Asia Minor. Uh, you get into this this place called the Anatolian Plateau, and it's just flat, high elevation desert, basically, just dry, arid, nothing around, nothing grows for miles. It takes like five days to get across. God. Yeah, and every single army that has ever had to travel through Anatolia has had to deal with this and have always lost a shit ton of troops in the process because of can't blame them. So before, so as they set off from Nicaea, um, to make it a little bit easier on each of their armies, so they're not just sucking up all of the supplies and food from the and scavenging loot from the area, uh, they split their armies in half and have them go separately to uh, to kind of alleviate, like they'll they won't have as many people to feed on each side, and, so, and they have a wider area to scavenge from. And so there's a French force that's led by. Uh, led by Gof- Godfrey, and there's a uh, combined Norman Italian force led by Bohemond, and so they go separately. They are intending to meet back up at the city of Doralam to to besiege it and get it out of the way on their way to the through the rest of Anatolia. On the way there, Bohemond accidentally adv- he he was a little impatient. He advanced his troops too fast and got out of range of the rest of the army. And he ended up getting ambushed by Arslan and his Turkish troops on July 1st. How did that work out? It's a mixed bag. Um, As it happens, Arslan had gathered a much larger army by this point, because like I said, he had a much larger army. He just didn't use it because he didn't think he needed it at first. So he's got his huge army and the Turks are... The Turks are really good horse archers. We've talked about Arslan had gathered a much larger army at this point, and Bohemond's army was immediately surrounded by horse archers, which is bad. That's a bad situation to be in. Uh, the Nor- the Norman troops closed ranks in a tight circle and held out for hours against successive waves of Turkish attacks before the French contingent finally arrived and broke through the Turkish lines. And so Arslan pulled his. Uh, Arslan was afraid he was about to get encircled, and so he withdrew his army, and they fled from the t- battlefield. So another victory under their belt, snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. Another tenuous victory that sounds like they could have like lost their asses at any point. The entire First Crusade is a tenuous victory that could be lost at any point. <laughs> Historical um, conveniences, I guess, is the best word. So our Sultan Arslan, now fearing that he wouldn't be able to beat the Crusaders on the battlefield, he began a scorched earth campaign. Any resources that the Crusaders would could scavenge were burned or removed as the Turkish army retreated. And so the Crusaders advanced into central Anatolia unopposed, but without food or water in the dry summer heat of the Anatolian Plateau. With no provisions, essentially. They had nothing, and they were in the Anatolian Plateau, one of the hottest places on Earth, <laughs> in the middle of summer. So it sounds like they fucked themselves over. Yeah. They, <laughs> on the way, several thousand guys died from dehydration. The scant few settlements they actually came across were immediately looted, and the inhabitants were usually killed. Some of these were Muslim. Some of these were Christ- were like Byzantine Christian, like Greek communities. Sounds about religious. Each of the uh, each of the commander. So obviously, these conditions were not conducive to like good management or cooperation. It was very tense. People were desperate, and uh, you remember the number of names I gave for the like the commanders of this army. You gave like five or six, right? I don't remember the names, but I remember oh, the approximate amount. 
yeah, there those are the main names. There's like ten or fifteen other like minor players that I didn't bring up because they weren't important, but they are all starting to fight with each other. And if of course like cracks were starting to show in the leadership structure and it's only going to get worse from here. If they're showing cracks this early, I can't imagine. Each each of these princes were now like kind of vying for like like even though they had Raymond and Adamar, who were supposed to be the two guys in charge, all of the princes were now fighting over who would actually have control of the army, because th- that's going to happen when you get a bunch of fucking bitch-ass noblemen in the room together. Um, you know, it's, it takes a while to move armies. It, it takes, I think it takes a couple of weeks for them to get across the plateau, and by that time, a lot of people had died from uh, a lot of people had died from starvation. Uh, but they finally reached the. Uh, you probably won't recognize this name, but we we mentioned this in the Alexander episodes. Also, uh, they reached the Cilician Gates in September. Yeah, no, no recognition on my part. Sorry. Um, do you remember when the story about when Alexander was crossing after Alexander his army had crossed the Anatolian plateau? They crossed the Cilician Gates, and then uh, they spotted a a river uh, with, and it was like the first major body of water that they had come across since for for like a couple weeks. And Alexander immediately stripped off his clothes and ran and jumped into the river. Oh, I vaguely remember that part. Yeah. And then it turned out to be like 50 degrees in the river and like 120 degrees outside. And so he immediately, his entire body cramped up and he caught pneumonia and almost died. And then a month, and then a month later, he fought the Battle of Issus and defeated Darius for the first time. I remember the river part. That's all I can tell you. Yeah. Well, this that all happened right around where we're talking about now, the Cilician Gates. So... After a brief rest, um, one of the French commanders, uh, Godfrey's brother, Baldwin, Baldwin of Boulogne, uh, he decided this, this is, this is where shit starts to get crazy. Okay. Just now shit gets crazy. Really? Uh, Baldwin of Boulogne decided that he wasn't going to do this whole crusade thing anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So he takes his portion of the army, he turns east, and he's actually, he's joined by uh, one of the Itali- Italo-Normans, uh, Tancred, the Bohemond's nephew, and they go off and they travel up east into Armenia. They go to Armenia. The reason they go to Armenia is because Baldwin has some ambitions of establishing his own little fiefdom in the region. So he's just going to try and take over. Right. So he said, fuck it to the crusade. And he inserted himself into Armenian politics. And I'm not going to explain all of the convoluted stuff that ended up happening. because It's a really long story. But basically what happened is he, he came with his little, his little portion of the army. He kicked out the local Turkish garrisons out of our, out of the region he was welcomed into the capital city of Edessa as a liberator because Armenians are Christian. And then a few months later, he let uh, the sitting ruler of Armenia at the time was murdered by an angry mob, which he let happen, even though he had an army that could have stopped it. And then the mob proclaimed him the new ruler. I wonder why he didn't stop it. Yeah, and so he became the first count of Edessa. Yeah. So that, that came out of nowhere. <laughs> that that all happened very fast. Um, the other crusaders were, of course, not happy with this turn of events. Uh, partially, there are three main reasons they were not happy about this. Partially because he had taken a large chunk of the army with him. And now he was he was not part of the crusade anymore. He was now refusing to keep going with the rest of his part of the army, partially because he had broken his vow to Alexios to return land to the Byzantine Empire, and partially because during this entire process in Armenia, he had taken along a contingent of Norman knights that were planning on just going to help him and then going back to the main crusader army. 
in the process of ge- being up in Armenia, he was besieging like a, a Turkish fortress. And at some point he fucked up, left them out in the open and they all got massacred in the middle of the night while they were sleeping. Like several hundred knights. And knights are really valuable and really difficult to replace. And so all in all, this whole situation was not great for morale for the crusade. (laughs) Anyways, yeah. So as you could imagine, this whole situation was not great for morale. So the, the remainder of the crusade, they trekked on. This time, their target was one of the most important cities in Christendom, part two of their three-part series on the First Crusade. The city was one of the five seats of the, patri- the patriarchs of the Christian faith, Antioch. Unfortunately for the Crusaders, Antioch was also one of the most well-fortified cities in the known world. Literally one of the best defended cities in human history is the city of Antioch. It was surrounded, Antioch is surrounded on one side by mountains and on the other side by the Orontes River. Any part that is open as on open land is defended by high, thick walls, like 30 feet tall walls, 10 feet thick, fucking huge walls. And the only way into the city is either through narrow mountain passes on the east side or by boat over the river on the west side. So during a siege, it could either be resupplied by river or by secret smuggling routes through the mountains. So it was really you it was nearly impossible to take this city by force, and it was nearly impossible to starve them out. And so, of course, the Crusaders began to besiege the city on October 20th, 1097. By January of 1098, just three months later, Crusaders were already starting to die of starvation. Interesting. They did not prepare. It was, yeah, this is not a good situation because most of these guys are French. They're really far from France. They were kind of relying on the Byzantines to help them out and supply them, but the Byzantines are having a lot of trouble because, like, they don't exactly have the resources to get supplies all the, all that that far out there so the the once zealous eager crusaders began to desert including one of the more important commanders like i haven't mentioned up to this point but he was he was an important military leader if not like a political leader this guy named stephen who is the count of blois which is a fucking weird name So this guy, Stephen, uh, on his way back to France, he stopped in Constantinople and he told Alexios that the Crusades' cause was hopeless. He he told Alexios, like, yeah, you might as well not help them anymore. They're, They're all fucked. You'd just be wasting money. And so, as it turns out, Alexios actually had a Byzantine army that was en route to reinforce the Crusaders. They were like halfway there. Oh, damn, really? Yeah, uh, but then when Stephen came came by and told him this, he ordered the his army to turn back around and return. Oof, oof. Strategic retreat much? Yeah, this would cause some problems later. Also, Peter the Hermit also tried to desert. <laughs> but he but he was captured and brought back. <laughs> <laughs> three sips for my man peter the crusaders they started the siege with about forty thousand troops and where are they at now twenty thousand almost half um yeah it's estimated that about one in seven crusaders died of starvation during this siege uh and the rest that that are gone now deserted and went back to europe in this environment, of course, not a good environment mentally. Paranoia and bitterness. But I would never think war is a good mentally healthy place to be. Yeah. Well, there's there's some weird contradictory uh, research into that. Because it's not good trauma-wise, but 
there have been there has been some research that like uh like there were a lot of researchers who studied like people's mental state and like research on mental health during the blitz in England during World War II. And they discovered that the average, like the average uh, mental health and like mental stability for like the average English citizen during the blitz in World War II was actually better. And there were like less people being admitted to psych wards and there were less people having like nervous breakdowns and things like that. Be- and they speculated that it's because during times of war, people who would otherwise be listless and have their minds open to being uh, like traumatized and and like not have no level of stability during times of war, they have something to do. They're helping with the war effort, whatever job that may be. And so be- that feels like more bullshit but just convincing enough to be reasonable to actually be a thing yeah it's the point of it was it was pointing it wasn't pointing out that like war is good for mental health because very obviously it's not if you've people who have been through war suffer from heinous trauma but there is an aspect to war that creates community yes that is 100 percent. i will get along with that Yeah. And so because people had a sense of community and were serving like a higher purpose, they had better mental health on average. So that's what that will, that's what with this, these studies kind of discovered. So it's, it's kind of a mixed bag because war can do that too. But in this particular situation, if you're starving to death and you've eaten nothing but like rations of butchered horse for a couple months, it's, it's not good for mental health. <laughs> Definitely not. So paranoia and bitterness caused some of the commanders, especially Bohemond, to begin accusing Alexios of causing all of their troubles uh, without any evidence. Like they started accusing Alexios of encouraging the Seljuks to, and like paying off the Seljuks to go and attack them and stuff. Bohemond around this time started to demand that once they captured the city, that he should take control of it instead of giving it back to the Byzantines. Because he's a power hungry piece of shit, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, that's that's basically what's going on. Is that a shot? We'll wait until it actually happens to take a shot because we're still in the middle of the siege right now. So. That's a sip. Every time someone does something cynical for personal ambition is a sip. Massacre is our shot. Yeah, that's a sip. The, sh- the shot is a massacre. Okay. So, yeah, this is... Uh... So he's starting to demand that he be given Antioch after they win the siege and not give it back to the Byzantines because in his mind, Alexios has already broken the vow even though he hasn't really... He hasn't literal by like actual actions, but like by virtue he has. Yeah. At this point, Stephen actually hadn't deserted yet. Um, and so Alexios was still acting on the idea that he was still helping out the crusade. And so he hadn't, he hadn't broken any vow yet. So Bowman was just talking out of his ass. He was, he was you know, just trying to find an excuse to like, all of this is mine once we're done with this. And so the and so Godfrey and Raymond, the other two prominent guys, uh, were both completely opposed opposed to that plan. They were still trying to stick to their vows that they gave to Alexios. During this siege, the Seljuks now now we're we've been dealing with some like periphery nations that were sort of aligned with the Seljuks and were still Turkish, but weren't actually the Seljuks themselves. Now we're dealing with the actual Seljuks, the actual Seljuk empire. Okay. The Seljuks sent out two armies to fight off the crusaders, but both of them were just barely pushed back and defeated. And this is something that historians talk about a lot. If those two armies had, because they were only like two weeks apart, if they had just waited and joined up and combined into one force and attacked at the same time, the crusade would have been done. They would have been dead. They would have all been wiped out. No future crusades? 
no future crusades. It all would have stopped right there. <laughs> but they attacked, uh, they attacked separately. And so they both ended up losing just barely. And so the crusade was able to continue their siege of Antioch. After these failures, a Seljuk military commander who was at the time the, the ruler of the city of Mosul in what's now modern-day Iraq, this guy was named Kawam al-Dawla Kerboga, which is a weird amalgamation of Arab and Turkish names that is really weird to say, but I like, I like his name. It's a cool name. But I'll just call him Kerboga, so that's easier. But Kerboga independently raised his own army separate from the Seljuk, uh, from the Seljuk hierarchy. He just raised his own army because he figured that, well, I know what I'm doing. I'm a pretty good, I'm, I'm a good accomplished commander. If I go and I deal with these crusaders, I could just take control of Antioch myself. And then I'll be one of the most powerful people in this entire region. So this guy, Kerboga, I'm just, I'm just going to say his name again. I really like his name. Kawam al Kerboga. He is gathering this giant army, at least as big as, they're not exactly sure how big it was, but it was at least as big. He usually outnumbered them. He, it, at least by the time they meet, he outnumbers them. So, Okay. Um, do we have like guesstimations on numbers or what? So at this point, um, the siege of Antioch is going to last eight months. By the time, yeah, they start with 40,000. They end with 20,000. By the, when, by the time that, uh, Kerboga and his army arrive, they outnumber the crusaders about two to one. So he probably has about 40,000. Eight eight months is it's a little long for a siege, but there are sieges that that have lasted longer, interestingly enough. I think there's one there's one siege um I think it was in like the fifteen hundreds that the Ottoman Empire did. It was like it lasted like ten years or something like that. It's fucking crazy. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I'll try and find it sometime, but whatever. So Garboga, he sets off and he, his plan is to relieve Antioch, but, and here's, here's where, um, there's one of those things that just fucking blows me away about how lucky these crusaders were. There's no reason this expedition should have been successful. And it was because of dumb luck like this, that it was, um, Kerboga decided that, Kerboga thought that the cruci- that Baldwin, the guy who had gone and set up the county of Edessa in Armenia, he thought that he was still with, that Baldwin was still with the Crusaders, and so he was afraid that if he went and tried to march on our, on Antioch to relieve Antioch, that Baldwin would bring all of his troops down and hit him from the rear. And so he decided he would go and he would go and attack Baldwin first. And so he goes and his army besieges Edessa. They are there for three weeks besieging this city until Kerboga finally realizes this guy isn't a cru- isn't with the rest of the army anymore. He's just doing his own thing. He's not going to attack me if I turn around. And so, and so he lifts the siege of Edessa and he turns his army around and he heads towards Antioch. And then... But the problem was the three weeks that he spent at Edessa was just enough time that the Crusaders needed to put their plan into action. (laughs) So he distracted himself just long enough to fuck himself over. Yep. So it turns out that Bohemond had actually discovered he had made contact with a defector in the garrison of the city. He was an Armenian man named Farouz, who was a he was a high ranking officer in the in the army garrison in the city, and he was a former Christian who had converted to Islam so that he could have like a military career. So just con- he converted simply for warmongering, not 
for actual faith. Yeah, just so he could have a career, like so he could have like a a career in the military, so he could escape. Like, because uh, Christians they weren't treated poorly, but they also didn't get access to like certain aspects of social and political hierarchy that Muslims did. So he converted to Islam, but he was still mistreated because he was Armenian. Um, And he also held a grudge towards the garrison commander because the garrison commander, who was Turkish, had 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 fucked his wife. Oh, wow. Yep. (laughs) And so was not expecting that. Yeah. So on June 2nd, 1098, Farouz helped sneak a group of crusaders into the walls. And with the help of sympathetic Christians in the city, all of the city gates were opened at the same time. Sounds like he had his, it set up right ahead for him. And so after the gates were open, a horn was sounded from the walls and the entire crusader army charged in. I know you you have a hard time remembering a lot of stuff that we talk about, but you you kind of get apologies. I have shit memory on anything, Derek. Nah, it's 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 all right. I've got pretty bad memory with a lot of stuff too. But you you kind of understand what happens when after a long siege, when the attackers have suffered a lot of casualties, there's a lot of frustration built up. So when they finally get into the city, what normally happens after that? Uh, Rape and pillage. Yep. Rape and pillage. There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, that happens a lot throughout history to be perfectly honest. Yep. That, that is just the standard. That's standard operating procedure for besieging armies. The soldiers, the crusaders rushed in and they took out the anger on, anger on the populace. They didn't just kill Muslims, who, but they, they focused on Muslims and pretty much the entire Muslim population of the city were killed. But they also killed a good chunk of the Christians as well, including that Armenian guy, Farouz. Uh, they didn't kill him, they killed his brother. <laughs> Drinks out for Farouz. Uh, that is a massacre of non-Muslim people. You want to... Come by. Prost. They finally have, after eight months of siege, half of their army is gone. They finally have control of the city. Keep in mind, they are down to 20,000 soldiers now. They started with 80,000. Jesus Christ, they're at like a fourth. Um... When I said that Kerboga's mistake to go after Baldwin and Odessa was like, it gave them the time they needed. Kerboga's army arrived two days later, two days after the city fell. And so he wasn't arriving to relieve a besieged city. He was now arriving to besiege a city, which is a much harder thing to do because now the Crusaders were behind their big secure walls. But Kerboga, though, he was a pretty aggressive guy. And so this prospect didn't slow him down too much. He showed up and he was like, all right, time to attack the walls. And so he ordered an attack on the walls. For four days, his soldiers charged into the fortifications, wave after wave after wave being cut down by the crusaders, the crusaders who were defending the walls. And after four days of just insane casualties, he just finally decided that maybe he should probably just wait this one out. No shit, Sherlock. He still outnumbered them pretty easily, though. He still had a lot more people than them. But, and at this point, the Crusaders, their morale was at an all-time low because... Can you blame them? No, I can't. This is... It, this is all like a lot of the people, like a lot of the contemporary sources, people who are actually here in the city during this time say that this, like crusaders say that this period when they're actually in the city was worse than when they were outside the city besieged. It, it, 
Can you believe it actually gets worse from here? Are you like saying that in the rhetorical sense? Or are you saying like, get ready for some more shit? I'm saying get ready for some more shit. You're going to make me cry. I I can't cry about these guys because I think these people are all assholes. But I just like drunk me saying, how can it get worse from here? So we, I, we get to some cannibalism in a little bit. Yeah, we'll get to that, though. Mean, but before we get to... They pulled a fucking Donner party. Jesus Christ. Before we get to that, um, on June 24th, the Crusade commanders decide that they're going to try and surrender. How does that go for them? They probably sent the wrong guy for the job, because can you guess who they sent to negotiate the surrender? Was it Pete? It was Pete! It was Peter the Hermit! (laughs) (laughs) Three sips! June 24th, they send Peter the Hermit uh, to submit terms of surrender to the Turks, and they, they were, of course, rejected. And so all hope for victory seemed lost. Now, what I'm going to tell you next is going to sound like one of those stories that seems made up after a fa- after the fact. Sounds like propaganda. Yeah, it sounds like propaganda, but this is corroborated by multiple sources who were actually there and witnessed it. And there is a comprehensive, like, fee- like there's a comprehensive amount of primary sources that document not just what happened, but people's reaction to it. And a lot of people at the time that I'll get into it. So there was this, there's this guy, he was a French. He's described either as like a peasant who had become a soldier. He was like a servant who had taken up a sword and become a soldier over the course of the crusade, or he was just a priest from France. And his name was Peter Bartholomew. And, This guy claimed that he had received a vision from St. Andrew informing him of the location of the Holy Lance, which the Holy Lance is... The Longinus? The Lance of Longinus, yeah. Yeah, the Holy Lance, the spear that pierced Jesus' side on the cross. Yeah, Longinus was actually the name of the Roman soldier who carried it. Yes, I am aware of that. He's actually a saint, I think. He is? Yeah, the sto- the story is that after the crucifixion, he was convinced of Christ's divinity and became like a full-throated Christian and ended up being martyred because of it. Uh, anyways, so after Peter Bartholomew, this random guy, uh, has this vision... Um, he 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 says that he knows where to dig to find it. He says it's underneath the altar of the St. Peter's Church in Antioch. And so they go and they start digging. They dig like eight feet down and they don't find a single thing. Um, and then finally, uh, Bartholomew hops in. He looks around for a minute, and then what do you know? He hops back out, and he has an old spearhead in his hand. He found the spear. And he found the spear. Coincidentally, the guy who had the vision found it in a hole that was eight feet deep and had that hadn't been found by anybody else who was actually digging in it. Nobody saw him pull it out of the ground. There's no way that happened that way. At the very least, it wasn't the true longest. The long unis or however it's pronounced. I'm bad at pronunciations. Yeah, I just call it the Holy Lance. But yeah, so the discovery of the spear, it it boosted the morale of the troops themselves, but it further divided the leadership. So Raymond, one of the two one of the two guys in charge, he thought that this was like a divine gift from God. He believed it wholeheartedly. He thought it was proof of God's will in the crusade. I mean, it, if you were in their shoes, probably would feel the same way. Not going to lie. Well, 
most of the other leaders didn't. Oh, really? Uh, Bohemond, Bohemond and Bishop Adamar both thought that he was full of shit. Again, can you blame them for thinking so? No, like I, I think he was full of shit too. <laughs> but no, I, I think he's full of shit now. <laughs> but nevertheless, nevertheless, it was the. Uh, I will say the reason Bishop Adamar didn't believe him is because he had already seen the Holy Lance in Constantinople. So there was already a Holy, a Holy Lance that they were claiming. There was already some, an item that claimed that title. So they were like, uh, that means we have to disprove the person who came up with this one. Nah, I'm not going to do that. Fuck you. (laughs) Uh, nevertheless, this was the kick of the pants that the Crusaders needed to finally do something and try to break the siege. Later on, after I, I need, I needed to mention this. I needed to. You felt it within your bones to mention it. I felt it in my bones. I had to mention this because you were going to love this story. <laughs> Tell me the story. Later on, after all of this whole thing was over, a bunch of people accused Peter Bartholomew of lying. And so they challenged him to a trial by fire. How different is that from trial by combat? A trial by fire is, it, they got it from the Old Testament. It's where a person would literally walk through fire. And if they came out the other side unharmed, it means that it was, it was proof that they had God on their side. Trial by fire was a literal thing. I thought that was a metaphorical thing. No, it was, it was a literal thing. Like they literally walked through fire, and if they were burned, it means they were lying. I hate history sometimes. And here's the fucking craziest thing in the world: Peter Bartholomew agreed to do this. He walked through fire, received third degree burns over most of his body, and died twelve <laughs> days later in excruciating agony. <laughs> all my homies hate him <laughs> all my homies hate Peter Bartholomew <laughs> this man couldn't survive fire fuck him this fucking guy <laughs> you know what's even crazier Raymond still believed him afterwards <laughs> oh my God. Raymond said that he had he hadn't been burned when he first walked through the fire, but after he passed through the fire unscathed, a crowd surrounded him and accidentally pushed him back into the fire, which is where he got his burn. <laughs> so four days after the Crusaders' surrender was refused, yeah, June twenty eighth, ten ninety seven, the Crusaders sallied out of the gates. They left their walls. They came. They started moving out of the gates. They started forming up in battle formation in front of the walls. They were going to attempt to fight to drive drive the Turks from the field and relieve the siege. Kerboga, on for his part, he thought this was great. He thought this was a great development. He was he literally he was like, let's just sit our pretty asses down. We'll wait for them to get outside and form up. We'll even give them a minute to like, you know, cool off, settle themselves, get get nice and settled in, getting ready for what's about to happen. We outnumber these guys two to one. So we'll just surround them and cut them down one by one once they're outside of the safety of their walls. This is great. This is this is gonna be a field day. We're gonna have the time of their life. Well, after only a few of the Crusaders, like just a, f- a couple thousand were out, out of the gate. Um, keep, keep in mind, the army that Kerboga was leading, this was not a well-disciplined body of professional troops. These were levies. These were farmers who had been pressed into service and given a sword or a spear and told to go and fight. These were not well-trained guys and so as soon as these guys saw the crusaders wandering out of their gates they just started charging they yeah like like half the crusaders were like halfway out they had like half of their troops out the turkish troops they started charging but they didn't charge all at once they went in little groups so like one group over here would charge in another group over there would charge in and so they they don't 
Yeah. So they were just arriving like in little groups at a time. So that completely negated the, the superiority of numbers that the Turks had. So by the time that these guys made contact with the crusaders at the gate, uh, it was actually the Turks that were outnumbered and also really poorly trained, really poorly armed, really poorly armored compared to all of these knights. And by the time Kerboga realized what was happening and realized that he had to commit his entire army now or the entire thing would be ruined, thousands of his troops had already broken and were retreating in the opposite direction. And so this confused mass of fleeing troops running in the opposite direction from the guys who were now charging broke up all of their formations and scattered them all around in this big mess so that when they, when the fresh troops finally reached the crusader line, they were all completely disorganized, separated from the units, had no idea what was going on, immediately broke as soon as they hit the line and started seeing a bunch of knights in their armor swinging swords and maces at them. They immediately ran. And so the Turkish army only lost a couple hundred dead, but within a couple hours, they were all fleeing the field. They were complete. The entire army was en route. And so the Crusaders won the day. By the skin of their fucking teeth. By the skin of their fucking teeth. <laughs> there was no reason they should have won this. Kerboka snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. Yeah, this, this was the Crusaders' Hail Mary. This was their Hail Mary, and it paid off not the way that they expected, but it did it did pay off in their favor. And so... And so now the Turkish army was forced to run and Kerboga left the scene. And I, we don't, he, we don't, we just don't hear from him again. <laughs> now Antioch is securely in Christian hands. But can you believe, I, I can't believe I am saying this, this fucking, the first crusade is the fucking weirdest shit I have ever read about. So, 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 so we had this, the first siege of Antioch where the crusaders were besieging. They were all starving to death. We had the second siege of Antioch where the crusaders were defending. They were all starving to death. Now there is nobody besieging anybody. The crusaders are just sitting their happy asses down in the city. And it's somehow worse. <laughs> of course it is. So... Around this time, they found out that the relieving army that Alexios had sent, the Byzantine emperor, they found out that that, that army had been recalled and they and Alexios was basically abandoning them. Can't, I'm not surprised. I about said, can you blame them? But like, no, there's no surprise there, to be honest. Um, In real politic terms, there's no reason to believe the Crusaders are going to win this, even if they have captured out... Uh, to be fair, yes. Like to be like, there's in no reasonable circumstance other than the fact that we know historically it did happen. If you were if you were hearing this story, you would not guess the sending. Right. Yeah. So some of the commanders, especially Bohemond, of course, who fucking hated. So so some of the commanders, especially Bohemond, who like we know fucking hates the Byzantines. They were outraged, and they saw this as Alexios breaking the vow that they had made. And so since the, vow, since the vow was broken, they had no reason to give Antioch back to the Byzantines. Bohemond made a claim to Antioch demanding that he should become its new ruler like Baldwin had done in Edessa. I think I mentioned that earlier. Uh, vaguely sounds correct. Yeah, Bald. Bohemond is now claiming the right to take Antioch as his own. The other commanders disagreed, or some other commanders, some agreed with him, some others disagreed, and thought that they should continue their co-op. Do you have a rough split? Um, it was usually... Bo um, Bohemond was gathering like some of the minor... Like the my, a bunch of the minor commanders who, uh, a bunch of the minor commanders who, like I didn't haven't mentioned so far, 
uh, because their names aren't important. Uh, most of the important guys like uh, Godfrey and Ottomar and um, uh, I'm starting to lose my mind now too, but most, most of the important guys were like, yeah, we should, we should try to stick with cooperation with the Byzantines, but Beaumont, his, he had his own thing going. Raymond, that's who I was thinking of. Adamar, Raymond, Godfrey, they they thought that they should be sticking with the uh, cooperation with the Byzantines because at this point they couldn't afford to lose allies. But Bohemond, who, yeah, like I said, always fucking hated the Byzantines, was like, no, this city's fucking mine. And so the infight, this infighting, trying to figure out like what the fuck to do about this situation they were stuck in the city for the rest of the year. They literally could not move because their leadership could not decide what to do. And like I said, this some fucking how was one of the most, was easily the most miserable period of the entire crusade was after the second, after the second siege. They weren't even fighting anybody right now. This was the worst part. A disease broke out at Antioch. It was probably typhus, but they're not entirely sure. It was probably typhus, though. Like, how much did the disease affect the soldiers? Like, how many people did it kill? Do we have a rough estimate? A couple thousand. So it shrunk the numbers even further from the fourth. Even further. It also killed Bishop Adamar. <laughs> I'll take a sip for our bishop. Our boy, Adamar. He died on August 1st. On top of that, the local peasants were all Muslim. And so all, none of them would give up any of their food to the Crusaders. And the Crusaders were now starving, and so they were too weak to go and start extorting people. They literally could not leave the city to go and extort food out of these people. Wow. There are some reports that during this time, some of the crusaders started to resort to cannibalism in order to feed themselves. They weren't cannibalizing each other. Um, they, whenever they could, they'd go like during this time they were going out and they were besieging some like local settlements, like some other local, like smaller cities, minor cities. And whenever they would occupy some of these cities, um, the people, the Muslim Turks that they would kill inside, they'd eat their bodies. Oh, what the fuck? Because that was the only food because that was the only food that was available to them. But they there's I I've seen it kind of portrayed as like they didn't see it as cannibalism because they weren't eating Christians, they were just eating Muslims. That that's the worst excuse I've heard of. It's not cannibalism, it's not Christian. Yeah, his I don't know if that's accurate. That's how I've seen it portrayed by some sources, but most seem to agree that it, it's actually kind of split. Not everybody thinks that this actually happened, but enough do, especially from like primary sources or like contemporary sources. That uh, And uh, because of all of these conditions, understandably, the soldiers themselves were growing very restless and word was starting to pass around about like a mutiny. They were, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be like a violent mutiny. They're basically just saying like, uh, if you, if the commanders don't do something soon, we are just going to get up and we are going to start marching to Jerusalem by ourselves without you. So we're leaving soon with or without you. So you better figure your shit out. Damn. And so in early 1099, the other commanders finally relented. And the surviving crusaders left Antioch on their way to Jerusalem, leaving behind Bohemond and his portion of the army. And he became the prince of Antioch. So from here, things get really fucking squirrely. <laughs> How the fuck does it get worse, Derek? We are we are now at the point where like no, uh, we're at the point where like the the all of these commanders now no longer give a shit. They are done giving a shit. I can't blame them. 
No, me neither. Um, so the first place where this group of crusaders, minus Bohemond and his troops, they stop off at the city of Arca, A-R-Q-A, Arca. And because they, they are besieging this city, and bear with me here, Raymond... Remember, he's one of the two guys that the Pope personally chose to lead this crusade and who is a fucking moron. He he is also the main guy who's complaining about the fact that Beaumont was taking Antioch for, him, for himself. Raymond is deciding now, if this is what we're going to do, if we're just going to take whatever land we want and fuck the consequences, I want my own little bit of land too. <laughs> And so he forced the Crusader army to tr- to besiege the city of Arca in preparation for moving on to take this, the larger coastal city of Tripoli, which is in modern-day Lebanon. And Tripoli would be the seat of his own new principality. The other commanders didn't want to do this. They wanted to beeline for Jerusalem. But Raymond was still basically the main guy with the most influence in this situation, and so he got his way. This siege lasted a month, four weeks, before a threat of a mutiny, of once again, a threat of a mutiny from the troops. It took three weeks for a mutiny threat to arise? Four weeks, yeah. Yeah, because they wanted to get to Jerusalem. They were fucking ready to get to Jerusalem. And so they threatened a mutiny, and so he finally had to give up the siege. Which, by the way, they didn't need to besiege these cities. They had no major military force that could threaten them from their rear. There, there, there was no tactical advantage to doing it. Right. The only reason they did it was because Raymond wanted his own land like Bohemond had done. But the problem is, Raymond's a fucking idiot. And so the siege lasted a month and then they gave up and they kept going. And so now Raymond, everybody knew how fucking stupid he was, including the troops in his own army. And so now he had no authority anymore (laughs) because nobody respected him. So now he is no longer leading the leading commander in name or in practice. I'd also like to point out at this point, the army is now dwindling at about 14,000. How the fuck are they going still? Like, for real? They've lost... They've lost, like, what? Is that, like, all but, like, a fifth? They started with eight... They started with 80,000. That's... I have no idea what, like, percentile it would be, but... Yeah, I'm bad at math, too. I'm a history guy. I'm not good at math. (laughs) So, finally... Finally, we're getting close to the big mama. We're getting close to. There's a big, there's a big kahuna in this episode. Jerusalem. That's what I'm talking about. We're getting close to Jerusalem. The whole point of this entire fucking thing. So the year before, as the crusade was just starting to success, successfully push the Seljuks back out of Anatolia, the Arab Fatimids in Egypt had successfully taken advantage of all of this chaos and had pushed the Seljuks out of the Levant and had taken control of Jerusalem. So now Jerusalem is in the hands of the Fatimids. So they're not fighting the Seljuks anymore. Now they're pushing into Fatimid land. So as the Crusaders approached, the Fatimid governor of Jerusalem, another great name, um, Iftikhar al-Dallah. Amazing name. I love these names. All I'm... All I know is I'm glad I'm not trying to pronounce it because I hate mispronouncing names and I feel like an asshole every time I mispronounce names. Yeah, Arabic names are really, they look really difficult to pronounce when you see them written out on a page, but then when you actually sound it out, it's really it's really simple because there's a lot of extra unnecessary letters they don't need. I just know my dyslexia would kick my ass if I tried to pronounce those names. Oh yeah! If you tried to pronounce this this name Iftikhar, you would not be able to in a million years. <laughs> well, you tell me if I'm wrong or not. It's spelled I F T I K H A R. Yeah, no, I wouldn't have guessed that pronunciation. So yeah, there's the he's the Fatimid governor of Jerusalem. He tried to make a deal with the Crusaders. He offered, basically, his offer was, 
we will allow any and all Christians completely free passage through the territory to come pilgrim in Jerusalem. The, we, they will not be harassed. They will be fully protected. They will not suffer any anything at all by coming through this land as long as you do not enter our territory, as long as your army does not enter our territory. That is his offer. Basically, his offer is GTFO and I won't kill you. Yeah, get the fuck out of here and we won't treat your pilgrims like shit. Um, obviously, this offer was rejected because now we're dealing with very angry, very tired, very uh, dedicated men at this point. Like anybody who's left is really fucking dedicated to getting to Jerusalem. Whoever's left is like the. He is the most. I don't know if Zell is the right purse, but like the most devout, like, you cannot stray me from my cause. I will serve the Lord. So, so after the offer was rejected, Adala responded by, and this fucking sucks. He ejected all of the Christians out of Jerusalem because there was a sizable Christian population in Jerusalem, of course. I had no idea about that. Yeah, there was an entire community of Christians that were living in in this region at the time. Um, they weren't they weren't Catholic and they weren't like Byzantine Greek Christian either. They were what's called the a lot of them were what's called the Syriac Rite. I have no idea what that is. They're like um, sometimes they're called like Syriac Orthodox. Again, I have no idea what either one of those are. Yeah, they're they're just Christians who are. They believe all of the same things that Catholics and Orthodox do. They are just not subject to the authority of either one of their churches. They and they they happen to be in Syria, or the area the area around Syria, and so so the bulk of the Christians that lived in Jerusalem were Syriac Christians. And all of them were expelled from Jerusalem. So there were, there was that. Not going to lie. That's kind of fucked up punishing an entire religion for the bad actors. Yeah. The reason he did, it was mostly a practical move. The reason he did it was because he had seen what happened in, uh, at Antioch and Armenian had, uh, let them in had had be, had betrayed the garrison and let the crusaders in and he didn't want the same thing happening to Jerusalem so he kicked out anybody who could be a potential traitor ahead of time and then on top of that what he also did was he poisoned the majority of the wells in the area so the crusader army wouldn't be able to uh uh they wouldn't have access to fresh water that's really fucked up poisoning a well yeah and he also had all of the trees surrounding the city cut down so that they couldn't the crusaders couldn't use any of the wood to build siege towers or any sort of siege engine like battering rams what they do with the leftover wood cuz there's wood you have to haul off the wood or something either bring it into the city or burn it that's a goddamn waste yeah it is a waste but so the Crusades swept, they entered the Levant, they swept through very quickly. They captured the cities of Beirut and Tyre. Do you remember Tyre? I vaguely remember Tyre, but I don't remember what from. Alex, Alexander's casual terraforming. Oh, yeah. Man playing God that early. Yep. The eight-month siege that resulted in an island becoming a peninsula. Yep, that, that city. Uh, Beirut and Tyre were both captured in late May. Uh, the cities of Jaffa, Ramla, and Bethlehem were captured in early June. And then finally, on June 7th, they finally reached Jerusalem. It's said that when the Crusader army crested the hill and saw the city for the first time, that the entire group of them began to weep. That's definitely just religious dogma, right? There's no way they all wept. Um, I'm sure a lot of them wept. Um, 
I doubt all of them wept, but you know, I, I, I bet a sizable portion of them did weep. If, if not for religious zeal, then just the fact that we finally fucking made it after all of this horse shit. Fair, very fair. Yeah. And so, so at this point, um, keeping in mind the number of troops that they have, they have about 14,000. This is not a lot. And Jerusalem is a pretty decently well, not as well defended as Antioch, but all, all things considered, Jerusalem was probably going to be a harder nut to crack than Antioch. The Crusaders didn't have the manpower to completely surround the city, and so they couldn't completely cut it off from resupply. And they didn't have the time to fully besiege it because they knew that the Fatimids would be sending an army to confront them pretty soon. And on top of that, of course, they didn't have enough food or water to scavenge for an extended siege because I don't I don't know if you know this. Yeah, I don't know if you know this, Tim, but it's a bit dry in that area of the world. I would have never guessed. Yeah, there's not a lot of farmland in the area surrounding pa- uh, surrounding Jerusalem and Palestine. So they decided that they'd have to assault the city head on and take it by force. But even that plan was sketchy because the few remaining leaders that were left, of course, as a tradition, they started to bicker and fight again. They tried, they tried an initial assault on June 13th. And this assault failed in no small part because an entire division of the army refused to join the attack. And it was a portion of the army from Southern France. They just sat in their camps while they attempted to assault the walls. And so this first attack was pushed back. So this, this whole situation is causing a lot of fucking problems. Um, they don't really know where to go from here. So they sit down and they're, they're planning for a few days. They're still fighting a few days after the initial attack, a group of sailors, this, and this is they're not um, came out of left field, but bear with me. A group of sailors from the Italian city of Genoa, uh, they were led by a name, man named, oh my God, this fucking name. How do you think I feel with my dyslexia and like scared to mispronounce names? Yeah. This is not just an Italian name. This is a medieval Italian name. Hit us with it, Derek. This guy's name <laughs> Guglielmo Embriaccio. My man, Guglielmo. Guglielmo Embriaccio. So Mis- Mr. Embriaccio arrives with his, his little fleet and offers his services to the Crusader army as engineers and also offers his own ships as spare wood to build siege towers. And so they, they literally take these ships apart. They destroy these ships and use the wood to build siege towers. And so as the towers are being built, we're okay. So we're about to get a third priest in this story. A third? All three of these priests are named Peter. Insert f- face to desk. <sniffs> So this this guy, another priest who has apparently been with the Crusaders this entire time, but this is the first time he shows up. His name is Peter Desiderius. He claimed that he received a vision from the now deceased Bishop Adamar. <sighs> Fuck people who claim they talk to the dead. <laughs> <laughs> he says that Adamar instructed the army to fast for three days and then march in procession around the entire city of Jerusalem barefoot. Oh, 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 oh. My, my man was on some good shit, is all I can say. This was an emulation of a story from the Old Testament about the fall of Jericho. I was about to say, is it the... I remember a, a song that Rem- vaguely talked about the marching around the walls of Jericho till it fell down. Yeah. Yeah, this is emulating the that story from the Old Testament. So yeah, they did just that. On July 8th, they made their procession barefoot. And then 
Uh, who shows up again? You want to guess who shows up again? Pete. Pete, old Pete, Peter the Hermit. They sip. Yep. So after they make their procession, they sit their happy asses down and they listen to Peter the Hermit give a. How come they haven't just killed him at this point for like fucking around and finding out? Because, because for some, he is a grifter and a con man. He is good at convincing people that he is worth something, even when he is not. <laughs> Ever, Dentley. I love this man so much. Pete is goals, but I hate Pete at the same time. I hate Pete, but I love him too. And so, according to the story, Pete uh, and of of course this whole this whole event, the whole procession barefoot. I guess it, it's possible that this story is true, but I'll, I'll let you be the judge. Um, it's claimed that Peter the Hermit gave a. If I don't believe it, you're taking a shot, Derek. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Peter the Hermit gave a speech so fiery and inspiring that it convinced the bickering commanders to to put aside their differences for the moment and coordinate long enough to come up with a plan. That's too, not too outlandish so far. And on top of that, they also received word the next day that a Fatimid army was marching north from Egypt. And so it was now or never, and they were, it was kind of lighting a fire under their ass. Okay, that that's definitely believable. I say we take a sip for Pete's ballsiness. I love you, Pete. So now the leadership united, the troops reinvigorated with religious seal, and the siege towers now fully built, they launched their second assault on Jerusalem on July 13th, with Raymond's forces assaulting the south gate and the rest of the army attacking from the north. After two days of successive waves of attacks on the 15th of July, the Crusaders captured the northern wall, causing the defenders of the city to panic and flee. Once they were inside, and this this is, okay, I know we've talked about a lot of death so far. More death? A lot of killing. This is, I, I need, I actually feel like I need to get serious about this one because this is actually like really horrific the 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 grim the real true grimness this is one of the most horrific things i have ever read about in my entire life once the crusaders were inside the city they proceeded to butcher the inhabitants are they muslim muslim and jewish i'm pretty sure if they're not all muslim that counts for rule three yeah that's that's what i was thinking too you want to go ahead and do that real quick Finish what you were what before I interrupted you, then we'll go ahead and take your shot. I have it ready. So this massacre is unlike anything that had ever been seen in that time. Like firsthand like people writing about it at the time say that this the massacre in Jerusalem was so far beyond like as we as we know from past episodes of this podcast sacking a city and killing the civilians was not an uncommon thing in ancient and medieval warfare not at all to be honest uh it was always horrible and horrendous but it was not rare it was actually very very commonplace it was very very commonplace yes but the contemporary accounts of this event from all sides christian muslim and jewish all of them agree that the brutality of this particular massacre was beyond anything that any of them had seen in their lifetimes. We, we don't know exactly how many people were killed. Of all of the estimates, they range from between 3,000 and 70,000. Holy shit, that's a wide margin. But the best, the best numbers that I've seen, the, the most accurate estimates in my opinion, are around 40,000. Holy crap. And the massacre was made all the worse by the fact that, along with all of the regular inhabitants in the city, the city was also filled with refugees who were fleeing from the Crusaders. Holy fuck. Holy fuck. One firsthand account from a Crusader says that the blood ran ankle deep in the street. 
and that's corroborated by several other uh, contemporary writings. Like, not an exaggeration, the blood was ankle deep in the street. And this is why you should not follow religion to this extreme. The worst of the slaughter happened at the Temple Mount, which is a place so sacred that the people who were fleeing thought that the Crusaders would never dare dare spill innocent blood there. One writer claims that 10,000 people were murdered there. It, and the weird thing is that that might have been an exaggeration. 5,000 people all just within the Temple Mount would not be an unreasonable estimate. Fuck the Crusaders. Oh, fuck the Crusaders. One story goes that when the Temple Mount was breached, hundreds of Muslims fled to the refuge of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And then when one of the commanders, Tancred, he was an Italo-Norman. When Tancred's men approached the mosque, he ordered his own men to stand down and then offered the people inside protection. They exited the mosque and were taken prisoner. And then the following day, they were all killed. About seven or 800 of them. Fuck the Crusaders. Many of the Jews in the city were killed when... Uh, they they fled to find refuge in their own synagogues, and the Crusaders burnt the synagogues down with people inside them. Anybody who survived the massacre either fled in the confusion or were taken prisoner and ransomed off. And that was the only ones ransomed were people that were like prominent and wealthy and had high profile figures. Right, and had, there weren't a lot of those. Anybody that they got, anybody besides that, and I'd, I'd like to point out here that. Um, the siege of Jerusalem has been seen by many throughout history, so, like ever since then, as a point of unity between Jews and Muslims. Can't really blame them at that point. They both got maximacred at that. Oh my God. That's, oh my God. Yeah, because in Jerusalem in that time, Jews and Muslims, and even even the Christians, even though they had been expelled by that point, but the Christian, the, all of them, they were all neighbors. They were friends. They were business partners. And um, there was, there was some, I'm sure there was some sectarian issues at the time. I'm not going to claim that there wasn't. There was obviously going to. What is sectarian? Differences like religious or ethnic differences um, that causes. Uh, that's obvious, but I feel like getting massacred kind of throws those issues to the side. Yeah, but. Um, there were sectarian differences within the city at that time, but by and large, the community of Jerusalem were not, they were not divided like socially between like religious or ethnic lines. They were all like a generally a community. They were three parts of a community, but they were all a community. And when the crusaders assaulted the city, it was Jews and Muslims fighting shoulder to shoulder to defend their city on the walls of Jerusalem. And it was the blood of Jews and Muslims that filled the streets of Jerusalem. So I, I, I felt the need. I thought that that was an important aspect of this to point out while we were on the topic. It is very much an important aspect. And it, it, I was not ready for to find out how bad this massacre was. I, I'm still so shocked. It was, this is one of the worst things that I have read about in doing this podcast. It's, it's really left me like, you, have you ever had a historical rage where like you would punch a per, throat punch someone if you ever got a time machine and you would just like never stop, just throat punch, throat punch, throat punch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I felt that a lot. Yeah. That, that's kind of where I feel like I'm at right now. Like, I, I know that's like a stupid summary, but like, oh, I, 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 I'm just at such an unfathomable rage. I can't communicate the amount of rage I have right now, especially with the alcohol involved. After the city was occupied, the Crusaders set to work converting all, all of the mosques in the cities into Christian churches and shrines. So at the time, there were two really, really important mosques on the Temple Mount. Um, I mentioned one of them, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and the other one was the Dome on the Rock. 
and they are two of the most important sites. Like besides Mecca in this, in Medina, these are like the most important sites in the Muslim faith are the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome on the Rock. They're insanely important to the Muslim faith. And both of them were converted into Christian shrines. Uh, the Dome on the Rock became the Temple of the Lord, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque became the Temple of Solomon. That last one was called the Temple of Solomon because the Crusaders believed that it was built, that the Al-Aqsa Mosque was built on the ruins of the original temple that was built by King Solomon in the Old Testament. It, it wasn't, by the way, but they thought it was. That sounds about right. Um, the shrine, that shrine, that particular shrine, the Temple of Solomon, would later be converted into a royal palace. And one wing of that palace would be used. Also, by the way, Al-Aqsa Mosque, as I mentioned, was filled with the seven or 800 people that, um, that were brought out and taken prisoner and then murdered. You shouldn't, you should never do that in my opinion on war. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fucking bad, man. <laughs> um, but that, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, it was converted into the Temple of Solomon. The shrine, and that shrine would later be converted into a royal palace. And one wing of that palace would be used as the headquarters of a new Catholic military order of knights that were called the Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Solomon. Fuck that order. Also known as the Knights Templar. Fuck the Templar. Fuck the Templar. <laughs> And we're going to get into a lot of a lot of more reasons to say fuck the Templars later once we do it the other Crusades. But uh, but yeah, so that's when in anticipation of when the the Templars start to become relevant. This is this is the way why where they get their start is this. Yeah, so the the story of the Knights Templar will be a it'll be a story for another time. On July 22nd, the leaders held a meeting at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. We still haven't taken our shot for the sacking. Oh, shit. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, let's... Kampai. Prost. On July 22nd, 1099, the leaders of the crusade held a meeting at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Which, do you know what the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is? No, I do not. It's the church that's built on top of the site that's purported to be where Christ was. Like one part of the church is where Christ was purported to be, to have been crucified. And then the other side of the church is purported to be the cave where he was buried and was resurrected. So easily this church is probably the most holy site in all of Christianity. And to, the, to this day, it's like the most important pilgrimage site for Christians on the planet. Uh, but the, the leaders met in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and they decided how they would organize the new state that they were, the new kingdom they were going to build in Jerusalem. And, of course, more importantly, who was going to lead it. So in this discussion, of course, our old, our old idiot pal Raymond. I thought you were going to say Peter. Peter the Hermit. <laughs> no, Raymond, and let me emphasize here. Raymond's a fucking idiot. I've I've said it multiple times. I cannot say it enough. This guy is a moron. <laughs> but Raymond, yeah, this man, Raymond of Toulouse, he starts out the meeting by saying that he did not want the crown of Jerusalem. And the reason he said this, because he wanted to do it as a show of piety, hoping that his performance of faithfulness and humility would cause the other pe uh, the other commanders to insist upon his appointment, which he thought that he was going to get anyway because he was the leading chief commander appointed by the Pope of the Crusade. Like like he was the Pope's handpicked guy, uh, of course. Like of course he would be the guy to take the crown of Jerusalem. And so and so of course when he said this, he said he didn't want the crown. So the other guys were like, okay, well Godfrey, do you want it? And so, of course, because Godfrey wasn't a moron, he said yes. <laughs> Can you believe this shit? Knowing how history goes, no, I am not surprised. <laughs> and and so and so, Godfrey, of, of course, accepted this 
this honor and Raymond thinking that he was going to get it and just cheated himself out of it, took his army and left town and just started raiding while he pouted. He's a little bitch. Because he was so upset about it. He's a little fucking toddler bitch. <laughs> and so Godfrey of Bouillon was named the ruler of the new kingdom of Jerusalem. But as as a uh, as like a political maneuver, uh, he refused the title of king. He didn't he didn't call him he wasn't crowned a king. Does it matter that he refused the title king? It didn't, but um, I, st- I still think it's kind of interesting. Um, so he instead, he took the title of prince and also the title of... What? That makes no difference then! He also took the title of... the is, It's in Latin, so it's Advocatus Sancti Sepulchri, which translates as Defender of the Holy Sepulchre. <sighs> Self-inflated ego much? Probably, yeah, but... Um, when at, when he was asked why he wasn't going to accept the title of king, as a justification, he said, quote, I will not wear a crown of gold in the city where our Lord Jesus Christ wore a crown of thorns. His head is so far up his own ass. All of these people, their heads are so far up their own ass. Yeah, so oh like I said, in reality, this was just a, it was a political mo- maneuver. It was a way to smooth over his seizure of power with the other commanders. Because he might have been taking control of Jerusalem, but at least he wasn't a king. So nobody got the title of king out of it. So that's, and so, well, a lot of them were already princes. All my homies hate princes. All my homies hate princes. And so just like that, the, and so the kingdom of Jer. this is how the kingdom of Jerusalem was founded. Um, we're, we're almost done, but the crusade was not quite over just yet. They still had, um, they still had to deal with the Fatimid army, which that that reinforcing army that was uh, marching north to to kick them out of Jerusalem. Uh, this reinforcing army actually landed by ship with twenty thousand troops at the city of Ascalon in August, which Ascalon is just southwest of Jerusalem. So yeah, the Fatimids landed twenty thousand troops at the city of Ascalon in August of ten ninety nine. Godfrey and Raymond both marched out to meet with them. At this point, they only had 10,000 troops. Only had 10,000. God damn. So to even the odds, they launched a surprise attack at dawn on the morning of August 12th, 1099, and ended up easily routing the Fatiman army because they were all disorganized. They were just off of the ships that were just organized. They were all fast asleep. They were like anybody who was awake was just waking up and they, uh, and they just cut off guard. And so the, and so the crusaders just swept in and completely routed them in one fell swoop and dealt with them super easy. That was the, the last major battle of the cruise, the first crusade. And theoretically, their next task was supposed to be to take the city of Ascalon itself so that they could keep the Fatimids out of it because Ascalon is a really good staging ground to launch an offensive towards Jerusalem. And so it would be in their interest to to go ahead and take care of that. But Godfrey and Raymond started to fight again. And so because, because they were fighting, they couldn't coordinate, they couldn't, coordinate like a surrender deal with the commander of the garrison in Ascalon and they didn't have the numbers to storm the walls and so they just slunk back to Jerusalem and so Ascalon would remain a thorn in the new kingdom's side after, for from that point forward because of course yeah and then after the after the final victory at the battle of Ascalon most of the remaining troops in the crusader army they considered their crusader vows fulfilled and all but a couple hundred of them returned home to Europe. And so that that is it. That is the first crusade is now done. The Battle of Ascalon is a perfect encapsulation of the first crusade and its relationship to future crusades because they won this immense against the odds victory now. The first crusade, an immense against the odds victory. But they're bumbling and 
Yeah, their bumbling in the aftermath will prevent them from capitalizing on it later, which will cost them dearly, dearly in the future. Um, I, I need to tell you right now, of the seven or eight crusades, I can't remember exactly how many there were now. It's frustrating me. But which ones are the per, the um, important ones? I'd say the first, the third, and the fourth are the most important ones. Which ones are you more likely to cover on the podcast? I'm definitely going to do the fourth one at some point because it's going to be like this. We're going to be cracking up the whole time because of how fucking stupid it was. Um, but the th- So it's going to be like a repeat of this episode. It's going to be so much worse. <laughs> oh, God. But I... And then the third, the third crusade is like the most famous one besides the first crusade, because it's the one that figures features all of the, like, like the individual people, the individual personalities that most people know of when they hear about crusades, like, uh, like, uh, Richard, the Lionheart and Saladin, um, like some of the most famous commanders of the crusades, they're involved in the third crusade. Um, but I will say now the only successful crusades were the first one and the fourth one. And the fourth one barely counts because <laughs> I, I'll get to it eventually, but it's their target was the city of Alexandria in Egypt. They never even got close to Alexandria, <laughs> but for some reason they still <laughs> ended up winning because they just decided to change who it was they were targeting. Originally they were going to, Originally, they were going to target the caliphate in Egypt, and instead, they ended up just destroying the Byzantine Empire. <laughs> How in the fuck? Because they owed a debt to Venice, <laughs> and they needed a way to pay it off, and so they paid it off by... Sh- that sounds like some drunk bullshit we would pull, Derek. <laughs> oh, I will go into detail into it in the future. It is such a... F- I love this story so much because of how stupid it is. But, yeah, so... As far as like crusades that actually relate to like crusader stuff, the first crusade was the only successful. <laughs> one. We've got at least we have at least six to go from here. <laughs> so, a little bit more wrap up. Um, Godfrey would die a year later, and the new Latin patriarch. So when the when the crusaders came in, they appointed a new patriarch of Jerusalem. Who was a a Rome like a Roman Latin uh, guy? Uh, this guy named uh, Dimebert of Pisa, which is a fucking stupid name, Dimebert. Um, and so after Godfrey died, a, literally a year later, the year eleven hundred, um, Dimebert attempted to seize the new kingdom and make it a personal possession of the church. But Godfrey's brother Baldwin, the Count of Edessa, the guy who, the guy who went off to Armenia and made his own little thing up there and abandoned the crusade, he outmaneuvered Dimebert and took control of the kingdom of Jerusalem and crowned himself king, making him the first king of Jerusalem. Um, so Bohemond. So after consolidating power in Antioch, Bohemond would eventually return to Italy and continue his own personal crusade against the Byzantines. He would eventually die in combat fighting at the Battle of Dyrrhachium against the Byzantines in 1108. Was this part of another crusade or is this just another battle? No, no, this is just another this is just another war that the the Italo-Normans had against, against the Byzantines. Um, Raymond, the fucking idiot. I, I literally, I cannot, I cannot talk about this guy without pointing out that he's a fucking idiot. Um, yeah. So after Raymond died, the fucking idiot, his heirs, his sons did what he couldn't. And they ended up capturing the city of Tripoli in 1109. And they founded their own crusader state there. So, Apparently his sons were a little bit smarter than he was and were able to accomplish what he couldn't. Um, over, over the coming years, uh, the instability in the Muslim world continued. The Seljuks and the Fatimids were unable to react to the creation of these new crusader states. And they, 
And so the Crusader states were able to consolidate and entrench themselves in the region's geopolitics, which, of course, led to further conflict and, as we know, more crusades down the line. But that is a story for another time. Definitely. This this was an action-packed episode. I'm not going to lie, Derek. This was a great fucking episode. Uh, real quick. Oh, sh- I just realized I didn't include what happened to Peter the Hermit. I should go ahead and find out what happened to him real quick. What did happen to Peter the Hermit, huh? He's also known as Little Peter, or Peter of Amiens, responsible for the Rhineland massacres. <laughs> Some have called him Blessed Peter the Hermit, though he has not been beatified by in the Catholic Church. So some people... Re- I sure as God to hope not. Some people revere him as a saint, but he hasn't been formally recognized as a saint. So they don't know exactly when he died. It was either 1115 or 1131. That's a huge difference. That's a huge difference. But for some reason, they know it was on July 8th. Um, Also, um, so he lived for a long time after the First Crusade. (laughs) Some other nicknames he's known by. Cuckoo Peter. Little Peter, <laughs> Peter of Amiens, and Peter of Acres, which I think that's probably the French word for Acre, which is a, a city in the Levant. Um, let's see. Later life. Very little concrete record for his life after the returning to Europe, and much of what is known as speculation or legend. Albert of I records that he died in 1131 as prior of a church of the Holy Sepulchre, which he had founded in France. So he founded his own Church of the Holy Sepulcher in France. Or or, or in Flanders, they don't know where. <laughs> Maybe, that's one account. It's thought that during the Siege of Antioch, during the days of famine and cold weather, Peter attempted to flee only to be captured by the Norman Tancred and placed back in the battlefield in 1112. So that was later during like the Second Crusade. <laughs> Apparently Tancred was there too, because that was 1112. That was, that was like 10 years after the First Crusade. Peter also held services of intercession for Latin and native recruits. Peter advised Greeks and Latins to form processions. As, I don't know what that means. It's generally quoted that he founded an Augustinian monastery in France named for the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. However, it was actually in Flanders at New... Okay, so he did found a monastery in Flanders, which is like modern day uh, Belgium. Uh, at Neuf Mostieu near Huy, or Huy, um, which may have been his, may have been his hometown. They're not sure. His tomb is in Neuf Mostieu Abbey, so it's presumed that this was his abbey. But in another tradition, the nearby Soliers Abbey is claimed claimed it was his founded. So there's like a couple different. Um, Apparently, there's a couple different abbeys, a couple different monasteries in Belgium that claim that he founded them, um, and but only one of them has his body. So, <laughs> um, Peter's obituary is in the Chronicle of Neuf Monsieur Abbey on its page entry of eight July eleven fifteen. The chronicle says that this day saw the death of Dom Pierre of of pious memory, venerable priest and hermit who deserve to be appointed by the Lord to announce the first to the Holy Cross. And the text continues with, quote, After the conquest of the Holy Land, Pierre returned to his native country, and also that he founded this church and chooses them a decent burial. The record further supports Nith Mosir's claim as his foundation. So it looks like he died in 1115 after founding an abbey in Belgium. This man is legendary. Oh, what a fucking guy. Oh, this is... Okay, I've decided if I ever had the opportunity to meet a single human being in all of human history, it is Peter the Hermit. I want to I want to have a fucking beer with this guy. Uh, just real quick, my sources for this were uh, God's War, A New History of the Crusades by Christopher Tyerman, which I am... It covers all, this book is a thousand pages long and it covers all of the Crusades. So I'm going to definitely be using this in the future. Um, The second book was The Crusades and the Christian World of the East. Also by a guy named Christopher, Christopher McEvitt. Um, So they're both very good books. You should 
uh, def- definitely. If you like academic history, you should definitely go and give those a look. So where can they find you on Twitter if they wanted to reach out to you? Uh, they can find me at Visigoth. The first I is a one, the O is a zero. Tim, give them all of the information that you know off the top of your head that I don't. So they can find me on Twitter at Tim, a.k.a. Otis, but they can also find the podcast on Twitter at Alex Society Pod, but also Facebook and Instagram at The Alexander Society Pod. And if they had liked what they heard today, please go ahead and give us a rate and review on your social media, on your streaming platform of choice, and have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Bye.